Good morning and welcome to our session, Technology and Methodology in Marine Archaeology. We are delighted to be presenting the first session on the first day of the CEPA Innovation Festival, and we're really excited that it has such a marine focus. My name is Phoebe Wild, and I'm a marine archaeologist at MSDS Marine, and this morning I'm co-chairing this session with Mark James, also of MSDS Marine. So we're just going to give a couple of minutes to catch any latecomers, and I'll just continue this uh, introduction at five past ten. Um, so just to recap on why we're here and why do we feel the need for this session. So since the advent of marine archaeology, the profession has been driven by developments in technology. From the introduction of scuba in the mid-20th century to the com commonplace application of photogrammetry for 3D modelling today, technological advances increasingly enabled access to and high quality visualisation of underwater sites. So by their very nature, marine sites are frequently harder to access or record than terrestrial sites due to their environment. Therefore, the application of innovative techniques often required to undertake archaeological investigations. This session aims to showcase the innovative applications of technologies and the new methodologies that are currently being used by the profession, both in commercial and academic spheres, to increase the capacity of marine archaeologists. So we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today with great topics ranging from the use of small affordable RODs through to forensically marking underwater cultural heritage. It is innovations such as these that really add to the toolbox of marine the marine archaeologist and ultimately increase not only the quality of our outputs, but the ease of which we can undertake our work. So again, I would encourage you all to submit questions to the Q&A area of Zoom. We should have time for a couple of questions after each paper, but we also have time built in at the end for further questions. So if you think of anything you'd like to ask at any time, please do use the Q&A. If you're asking a question for the end, then please indicate which presentation the question relates to. So now I'd like to hand over to Mark, who's going to start this morning's session with me, talking about how marine archaeologists are using technology to go back to basics. Great, thank you very much, Phoebe. Um, so thank you for coming along today, uh, not just to this presentation, but to the C4 Innovation session in general. So rather than talk about new advances in technology, we just wanted to have a look at how technology is being used to get back to archaeological recording basics and the methodology that we use for achieving this. So with a broad audience, not just those of us from the marine world, we wanted to demonstrate not just the technology we use, but how this technology can help us achieve a traditional archaeological output and how this output can then be used by the volunteer diving community who, more often than not, don't have access to this technology. I'd like to stress at this point that what we're presenting, it isn't new. Uh, similar work has been undertaken for a number of years, but it is an interesting look at how we can and do use these technologies to exist in basic archaeological recording. So due to the submerged nature of many of the sites we work on, we're reliant on technology just to gain access, be this the use of scuba or surface fly diving equipment or remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. So unlike terrestrial sites, even taking a simple photograph or creating a basic site plan requires specialist equipment, often including diving gear, boats, a team to get a diver in the water and all manner of logistical issues such as tides and weather to consider. So technology doesn't just help us do our job, it's necessary for us to do our job. So most of us will be aware of the impact technological advances have had on the way we work, the outputs and how data is now presented to a wider audience. This includes things like increases in the resolution of sonar systems, ROVs becoming smaller and much more affordable, acoustic tracking systems becoming more accurate, smaller and easier to deploy, and cameras being higher resolution and more able to cope with low light conditions that we find underwater. These can provide us with ever increasing visually impressive outputs or data to higher degrees of accuracy. So as we have limited time available, we're just gonna take a look at two commonplace pieces of equipment, multi-beam sonar, and acoustic tracking, and then how these systems have been employed on two sites, the Bronze Bell Wreck in Wales and the London in England. The two sites have been chosen as they're in very different environments and with different starting points of data available and the required outcomes. So one of the key aims on both of these sites was aiding the work of the volunteer archaeological community and the site licensees. So we're going to start with multi-beam bathymetry. So multi-beam bathymetry or multi-beam sonar, uh, it works by using high frequency sound waves within our, there, sorry. Multi-beam sonar works by using high frequency sound waves. Within archaeology, we typically use between four to 700 kilohertz. This creates a three-dimensional image of the seabed. 
A sound waves formed by a projector mounted to a boat are sent to the seabed. And the time they take to return to the receiver can tell us the distance that wave has traveled. It's the same principle as to how a depth sounder on a boat works. The main difference being that rather than just one beam, a multi-beam uses multiple beams in a fan-shaped array, such as you can see in the, on the screen. So data is collected very quickly to create a carpet of accurately positioned points on the seabed. And you can see this to the, the left of the screen. This is called a point cloud. This point cloud can then be viewed in 3D, have a surface applied to create a digital terrain model, and effects such as shadow can be applied to highlight features. It can also be used to create visually impressive images, which can show a great deal of detail about a wreck. And uh, the image on the right is the James Egan Lake, and this is, this is point cloud data. So multi-beam was developed in the 1960s, but it really started to take off in the 1980s, and largely as computers became cheaper and more powerful. The early systems are incredibly low resolution, operating at around 36 kilohertz, with around about 20 beams. The systems we use today operate between 400 to 700 kilohertz and have between 256 and 1024 beams. Uh, some of these are physical beams and some of these are software based. So with technological advances, both in the, the multi-beam system and within the positioning and motion sensors we use, we can now expect to achieve a ping on the seabed within every five to 10 meters square. And this is in the depth that we regularly work in. So this is a significant increase in resolution and data quality from where we were even 20 years ago. Aside from the resolution of data, technological advances have meant that systems have become more accessible, with the cost of undertaking high resolution surveys at a point now where they've become almost commonplace in the preparation for underwater fieldwork. At the lower end of the market, systems are now being produced that are within the budget of even very small archaeological units. And whilst the resolution is not comparable to the high end systems, they still allow accurate and repeatable surveys to be undertaken to not only identify potential archaeological features, but to map the seabed topography, which can help us understand the preservation potential of an area. So as an example, we are currently working with the Honor Frost Foundation in Lebanon, installing a WASP multi-beam system for them and training their archaeologists on its use. So this slide just gives some examples of the, it's the same data set, but it's been gridded at different densities. So this is how many points per cell on the seabed. So you'll notice there's this significant difference in detail of what, between what we aim to achieve now with 10 centimetres and the 25 centimetre and 50 centimetres, which was common in the past. So what do we use this high resolution data for? Well, that depends on the site and the objectives. Typically, however, we use it to look at seabed topography, the distribution and condition of material, any impacts from scour, moving seabed levels, or, or from human impacts such as fishing, field work planning, or to create visualizations for dissemination to the public. Data collected over multiple years can be used to assess changes to the site and the local environment. Calculations can also be made to establish the amount of sediment loss or accretion over time. And all these help us to understand future management priorities. So that was a very brief look at multi-beam bathymetry. Yeah, so we'll now just move on quickly to acoustic tracking. So as with multi-beam, acoustic positioning is not a new technology. Indeed, it's not even new in marine archaeology. Probably the first example within archaeology dates back to 1975, when Nigel Kelland of Sonodyne undertook a range meter survey of the Mary Rose, and this was prior to the excavation in 1982. The use of acoustic positioning has continued on the Mary Rose site ever since, using different systems and technology as they've evolved and advanced. Other early examples include the use of uh, the Sonodyne rough track on the Resurgum in 1997. Uh, and then in 2004, uh, Senevine Fusion System was used again on the Mary Rose, which managed to achieve the highest ever accuracy of 30 millimetres. By the early 2000s, it was in fairly regular use by a number of marine archaeological organisations. So acoustic tracking determines the position of a beacon on the water in relation to either a transceiver mounted on the vessel, uh, which would be an ultra short baseline system, or a network of transponders on the seabed, which would be a long baseline system. To put this into a terrestrial context, this is not dissimilar to using a robotic total station or, or trilateration. So with the acoustic tracking connected to a, a GNSS or GPS and heading sensor, this enables the position of the beacon to be, pre, to be presented as a real world coordinate. This position can then be output to a geographical information system or GIS and the position displayed in real time, often underlaid with georeferenced images from multi-beam or size scan sonar or historic site plans. This allows the diving supervisor to guide the divers or an ROV pilot to guide his ROV around the seabed. 
So how has this technology moved on since it was first used in 1975? As with most survey equipment, the overall methodology of use has remained similar, but advances in technology have allowed accuracy to improve and systems have become smaller, more reliable and often cheaper. One limitation of acoustic tracking within the marine archaeology world has always been the setting up and calibration of the system, especially on short jobs using vessels of opportunity. The technology is primarily used within the survey industry and as such does require a level of specialist knowledge to set it up in such a way as to produce the most accurate and repeatable results. As well as the transceiver, which is often heavy and bulky, the system also requires a GPS, a motion reference unit and a heading sensor. The equipment all must be mounted onto the vessel, measured in and then calibrated without any movement between the different sensors. Inaccuracy in these measurements can cause the beacon positions to be wildly inaccurate, even with calibration. The intricacies of mobilisation and calibration, as well as the cost of the systems, meant that whilst tracking was used by some organisations, it was out of reach of a number, especially smaller ones. One of the biggest recent developments within acoustic tracking, certainly that has been a benefit to us, has been the release of Sonodyne's portable Micro Ranger 2 system. Uh, the system was designed to fulfil the requirements to produce an affordable but accurate tracking system, all within a Peli case that could be mobilised and calibrated quickly and easily. So we've been working with Sonodyne over the last season to trial this system that is deployed on every single site we've worked at, and it's very quick and easy. As you can see in the images, that's the size of, of the unit. So this is something that we really want to get back into, into standard practice within marine archaeology. So what do we use acoustic tracking for on an archaeological project? Many things, from guiding divers and ROVs around sites or to features, uh, to put the position of divers over geo-referenced images, recording the locations of features and artefacts, establishing search patterns, and viewing areas of the site that have been covered and perhaps not archaeologically, but we also use it to increase diver safety by knowing where they are all the time. So I'm just going to hand over to Phoebe now, who is going to run through a couple of case studies. So it's a fairly short presentation. So if you'd like to know more about the equipment we've discussed, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thanks, Mark. So my first case study is the Bronze Bell Wreck. So the site of the Bronze Bell Wreck, previously known as the Talibont Wreck, consists of around 65 tonnes of Carrera marble in 42 blocks, and 27 iron guns. The archaeological evidence suggests the vessel was not particularly large despite the heavy armament, and the cargo and finds suggest it was a French trader transporting Italian marble via Genoa or Leghorn. No timber remains have been identified in any investigation. However, local historical information suggests the timbers were recovered and reused in a building at the nearby Corsi Geddel Hall, and other recovered artifacts were also used there. The Chlaenwin Parish Register records the death of Juan Benedictus in 1730, who may have been a survivor of the wrecking event. Since discovery, the site has been subject to a series of investigations, both on and off the site, from various organisations and individuals. This summer, MSDS Marine undertook inspection, survey, investigation, recording and monitoring the Bronzeville site on behalf of Cherish. So the diving conditions on the site can be very good. So it lies approximately 500 metres from the shore and the depth is around seven to eight metres. So like any site, visibility can be variable. However, periods of good visibility are not uncommon here and we were incredibly lucky enough to have between two and four metres during our time there. During good neat tides, it's possible to dive the site continuously throughout the day. So as mentioned, the site's been subject to a number of investigations over the years, including long-term involvement by Gerrant Jones and also the Malvern Archaeological Diving Unit. These investigations have led to the recovery of a significant number of artefacts, which can now be found at the Maritime Museum in Barmouth. Another output has been the production of a two-dimensional site plan, drawn using traditional techniques, including offset and range and bearing measurements. Painstaking work that was completed over a large number of dives. So the site plan created has been the basis for work undertaken on the site and formed the base map for works undertaken by Wessex Archaeology in 2006. But one of the requirements of Cherish was that we updated the site plan during the diving work. Not only this, this would allow them to monitor change on the site going forward, but it would give licensed divers a useful resource for undertaking future works and allow easy navigation around the site without the use of expensive technology. The original aim was to undertake this in a traditional manner. However, two high resolution multi beam data sets were available to us one collected in 2014 by us from MSDS Marine, and one collected in 2020 by Cherish. So, as you can see, the main components of the wreck are clearly visible. This includes the cargo of marble, the cannon, and the anchors. So we then georeferenced the original site plan over the top and overlaid it on the multi-beam data. So as you can see, this really goes to show how with time and commitment, the results can be achieved, that can be achieved using traditional survey techniques can be incredibly good. 
using the multi-beam data and being guided by the original site plan, we're then able to identify features and draw them in ArcGIS. The features are plotted into the correct position, the assumed orientation and to the correct scale as far as is possible using the multi-beam data. So the result being an updated traditional 2D site plan, and this is before we even got in the water. In recent years, there's been an emphasis on using visually impressive multi-beam data to present the results of marine archaeological work to a wider audience. However, in this instance, with the multi-beam data, we've, been, we've used it to create a site plan to enable work to continue efficiently on the site by the volunteer dive community. So this is how we use multi-beam data to get back to basics on the Bronzeville wreck site. To complete the site plan, there are a couple of tasks left to, be, left to, um, to go. The first being to check the orientation of the cannon, although in some instances it is possible to identify the muzzle end in the multi-beam, although this was not always the case. The second task was to ground truth each feature to ensure they were not geological in origin, and to check that no additional features were obscured, for example, by being underneath an anchor or cannon. So we achieved this during diving field work by using the acoustic tracking system to systematically navigate the diver to each, site, each feature on the site plan. Each feature was measured, the condition assessed, and the orientation recorded. Where features were identified in the original site plan, but not in the multi-beam, these areas were also investigated, and the presence or not was recorded. This is particularly important to a number of, um, for a number of swivel guns because these were marked in the original site plan, but these have since been removed from the site, and some of which are now in the Museum at Barmouth. So this slide shows almost all of the routes of the divers during the project. We had to leave some off as we were achieving six hours of bottom time each day, meaning that it starts to, be, starts to get a bit cluttered when we present them all. So in summary, the objective to produce a 2D site plan was achieved through the use of multi-beam sonar and acoustic tracking. So if you'd like to know more about the site and the work we undertook, then we can send a link to a series of video diaries produced as part of the project. So I'm now going to move on to the London wreck, uh, more specifically site two of the wreck site. So the London is an important 17th century protected wreck site comprising two areas of extensive submerged archaeological remains lying in the Thames estuary off South End. So the wreck is managed by Historic England on behalf of, the, of DCMF, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, and is currently undergoing a programme evaluation and regular monitoring, monitoring by the highly motivated voluntary licence team led by Stephen Ellis, with oversight provided by the nominated archaeologist, Mark Beatty Edwards. So in stark contrast to the Bronze Bell site, diving conditions can be best described as challenging. Visibility can range between zero and one metre, with 50 centimetres being quite a reasonable day. It's almost always dark. The site lies in the tidal Thames, and slack water periods are short and must be timed incredibly well. The conditions mean that achieving archaeological objectives is incredibly hard unless you have a very good understanding of the site, and even then it's very difficult. For any terrestrial, terrestrial archaeologist in the audience, the best way to describe this would probably be to imagine you're recording a trench on your own at night in the middle of a gale with torrential rain, and you're also carrying a backpack full of rocks. So while we've been involved in the site since 2014, the time we spent underwater was actually quite minimal compared to that of the licensed team. So our role in the last couple of years has been to support their work by undertaking more specialised tasks, which gives them the support they need to continue. So due to visibility conditions and the ever changing nature of the site, one of the biggest challenges faced by the team is recording the positions of features, finds and areas of change, not only relevant to each other, but positioned as a coordinate. While the recording of the team has been exemplary using traditional methods, translating this into the real world has not always been easy. To measure one feature in into known points can often take an entire dive. And while the relative accuracy is good within defined areas, completing a jigsaw puzzle across the length of the site is far more challenging. So to aid the licensed team and to inform previous excavations and to help monitor change on the site, we've undertaken two high resolution multi-beam surveys, one in 2016 and the other in 2020. So while the surveys are good and the wreck is clearly defined, as you can see, the types of features being identified by the team are not visible in the same way that they are in the Bronze Bell wreck site. That means that producing a site plan from this data is not really possible in the same way. So stable features such as a large anchoring, frames on the later wreck to the south, and a concretion mound are quite prominent, and these could be used to triangulate identified features. However, the visibility conditions mean that identifying the exact location or even identifying the correct frame is not always very easy. So how can technology available to us be used to assist the work of this licensed team? So the first stage was obviously discussing with Steve what he wanted us to be able to what he wanted to be able to achieve and how we might be able to help him do that, with the ultimate goal of being able to position features, for example, accurately positioning them on the seabed as well. The equipment available to Steve means that all of his work is undertaken by hand, using tape measures, compasses, and drawing boards. Steve has also been using Site Recorder, a GIS package developed for marine archaeology, 
and increasing his, his knowledge of the software was considered key as it allows us to not only import as it allows not only the import of multi-beam data, but helps with the calculations of positions using offset measurements from known points, as well as being able to create records of all required information photographs. So the next step was to understand what was the easiest way, what the easiest way for the team was to obtain measurements that they required. It was decided to install a network that we should install a network of control points, um, and we could establish those positions in the multi-beam. And these would be of use to the team where they in the in, where they predominantly work. And where they could find them easily. The control points also have to be substantial enough to withstand the conditions in the Thames. So 3H Consulting kindly provided the team with suitable points and locations for the installation were decided. To ensure that the control points were positioned accurately, we decided to swap out our micro ranger tracking system for the mini ranger system with a, sl a, a stated slant range accuracy of 1.3% plus or minus GNNS errors. This would be an acceptable margin of error for future measurements to be based on. With the vessel anchored directly over the site, um, which would equate to up to one, uh, sorry. with the vessel anchored directly over the site, this would equate to up to 0.5 meters of accuracy. To make this, to make sure the system was set up and calibrated as well as um, as well as this, a uh, Sonodyne engineer and attended for mobilization. So with two Sonodyne systems available to us, we also took the opportunity to run them both side by side and to compare the data between the smaller, more affordable system and the survey grade system. To do this, we fabricated a custom mount to keep everything in the same place and to make comparison as fair as possible. The diving operation was undertaken in surface supply. The divers were deployed with a monitoring point and using the acoustic tracking, we, were, we guided them to the location that Steve had requested. On arrival at the location, the monitoring points were installed, labeled with a unique, unique identifier and the position of each were recorded. So over the course of the project, 12 monitoring points were installed, including a label stating features, uh, stating, sorry, including a labeling stable, sorry, including labeling stable features that could also be used. The opportunity was then taken on the dives to record the location of these features and also ones previously identified by the team. So the results with Steve, gui with Steve guidance as to locations, we installed a network of accurately positioned control points, which could be imported into SAC recorder. The locations can now be used by the team to measure in features accurately using traditional methods, but these measurements can now be positioned in the real world. The additional features recorded will now be used to complement the site plan being created in site recorder. The monitoring points have proved effective as a day after we installed them, Steve was back on site and was successfully measuring in features. Later this year, Steve and the team will be coming up to our offices um, for further site recorder training to complement his existing knowledge of the programme and to help build up a comprehensive site plan. So that was a brief look at some of the work we've undertaken on the Bronze Bell and London Rex this year, and how we've used some of the technology available to us to achieve what, what can actually be considered basic archaeological recording. The method for, the, for using this technology has allowed the production of very accurate site plans, while also saving time over traditional methods. This technology has also, pri has also provided a starting point for traditional recording where conditions have made this difficult otherwise. So we'd just like to say a really big thank you to Historic England and Cherish for letting us talk about these two projects today. And also, thank you very much for listening, and we absolutely welcome any questions that you have. So I'm just going to look through there. All right, so thank you very much for, for finishing off, Phoebe. Um, it's, it's obviously a bit hard for us to answer, to ask questions on our, our own presentation. So we're just going to have a quick look now, see if any questions are coming. So we've got one question here. Okay, so do you think this diver tracking technology should be used on all sites in the future? Um, it, yes, uh, wholeheartedly, and that, that's one of the reasons we've been we've been trialing a particular system. Um, it's, it's not meant to sound like a sales pitch for 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 Sonodyne, but um, it, it's it's designed to be easy to deploy. Um, as you saw, it's just in the paddy case. We fabricated a, a four meter long pole, basically screw each bit at the top of it put it in the water, run some very quick and simple calibrations, and then the accuracy, you're looking at around about a metre to a metre and a half um, in, in maybe 30 odd metres of water uh, for, from the test that we've done. Um, it, it should be used, 100%. Okay, well, actually, that, that timing brings us quite well onto our um, on our timetable. So I'd like to hand over to the next uh, presenters, and these will be Dr. Sally, Sally Evans, Dr. Michael Grant and Professor Philip Toms. Um, 
Their presentation is titled Shedding Light on Submerged Prehistory, New Protocols Integrating OSL Dating Within Developer-Led Geotechnical Campaigns. So looking forward to this presentation from Sally, Michael and Phil. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, as Phoebe just said, our presentation today is going to look at protocols for successfully integrating optically stimulated luminescence or OSL dating within developer-led geotechnical campaigns and OSL analysis methods, which essentially allow us to investigate and better understand submerged prehistoric landscapes. So it's going to be presented by myself, um, Sally Evans from MSDS Marine, Dr. Michael Grant, um, so Michael's from CORS based at the University of Southampton, and Professor Philip Toms from the University of Gloucestershire. Um, the information within the presentation is based on geoarchological work we carry out together on development-led projects. Um, and we're going to focus on a case study um, from a site where, uh, where we're all as our clients. Um, so MSDS typically manage the work as part of wider contracts, while CORS carry out specialist geoarchological work and the University of Gloucestershire conducts the OSL analysis. So this slide just contains an overview of our presentation. Broadly, um, we're going to be discussing a workflow and methods we use in geoarchological work and the results from using these methods. So we'll look first at paleolandscapes, just to introduce them, the geoarchological process and OSL. We're then going to look at OSL sampling methods and the workflows which allow for the integration of this and other geoarchological analyses within the geotechnical campaigns. And then we'll get into the interesting bits and cover OSL analysis methods, followed by the results from using these techniques. So submerged prehistoric landscapes are one of the key things we look at in marine archaeology. The earliest evidence for hominid activity in the UK dates back nearly a million years, and over this period there have been really large-scale environmental changes, which are driven by the expansion of glaciers during ice ages and their subsequent retreats, and then the associated rises and falls in sea levels. So evidence of these environmental changes survives in sediments which lie on and below the current seabed, and we can investigate these sediments to tell us about paleolandscapes. So we can do this by looking at geophysical and geotechnical data, and in particular through the collection of geotechnical samples such as boreholes and fibre cores, and it's the analysis of these cores which we're going to focus on today. So geotechnical campaigns um, involving the collection of cores are often undertaken in association with marine developments. So in addition to providing information which helps site engineers, they also provide data and samples which can be analysed by geoarchaeologists to understand paleolandscapes and environments. So typically this assessment and analysis of cores takes place in a series of stages following best practice guidance. So this slide just sets out the main steps which include review of core logs and photos, visual assessment of the cores, subsampling and then assessment analysis and publication where it's warranted. The assessment and analysis stages involve a series of different specialists who look at different parts of the sample. So these include any remains of pollen, diatoms, foraminifera, mollusks etc, all of which can be used to understand paleo landscapes. Dating of the sample is also important and there are a number of techniques which include OSL, um, which can be uh, undertaken to investigate dates. There are some specific constraints which need to be taken into account to ensure OSL analysis is successful though. Um, so we're going to look at the, those. So um, OSL dating is essentially a technique which determines when buried sediments, so normally quartz and feldspar, were last exposed to sunlight. So for this reason, it's really light sensitive and any light that's shed on the sediments during core collection and processing can effectively cancel out um, or alter earlier signatures, removing the potential for dating of earlier events. So because of this, we need to be really careful um, to use protocols which make sure that sediments retain their OSL potential. Um, previously, guidance documents indicated that cores earmarked for OSL dating should be collected in opaque liners, which shield them from the light. Um, however, Phil developed a new technique which allowed for cores to be collected in normal plastic liners um, and then opened under normal lighting conditions. So using this technique, cores which have been split longitudinally can be wrapped using several layers of cling film and aluminium foil, which effectively protects that sample from light. So this is basically a large sample at this point, and then subsampling for the actual analysis takes place within the OSL lab and involves extraction of sediment, which has not been affected by the light um, exposed during the initial processing. So to make sure that we can implement this protocol properly, early engagement with the client and geotechnical contractor is really, really important. So this slide just summarizes um, where this engagement takes place within our projects, as well as giving an overview of the staged geoarchological work I just mentioned earlier. So everything above the dashed yellow line happens prior to core collection. So we tend to have detailed chats with the geotechnical contractor prior to core collection to make sure that we can develop workflows which will be successful and align with the contractor's plans. 
And um, so we include these workflows within our method statement on the collection and retention of geotechnical samples and stage one and two geoecological assessments. So that first method statement covers everything to the end of stage two, which is the visual assessment of the cause by the geoarchaeologist. So this method statement is also produced in agreement with Historic England. Um, so essentially, by this point, we, we want agreement on everything from the client, geotechnical contractor and, and curator. Um, so in the pre-core collection periods, we've also got input into core locations to make sure archaeological objectives are factored in when decisions on core locations are made. Um, and then prior to core splitting, we provide toolbox talks to the geotechnical lab teams and conduct the stage geoarchological process once the cores have been split and the logs have been produced. So this slide just contains a couple of examples of workflows um, which are included within the method statement for putting this protocol into practice. So in both examples, we provide geoarchological tool, toolbox talks prior to core splitting um, to brief the geotech lab teams on the protocols for storage, um, which is the wrapping using cling film and foil. So the, in the example on the left, we also provided additional information on how to identify optimal OSL samples, allowing the lab team to identify these within the cores and store appropriate ones for us. And then in the one on the right, the lab team is able to store half of each core, um, so a core which has been split longitudinally for us in the manner which preserves OSL potential. This kind of reduces the need for decision-making on the part of the geotechnical contractor, but also increases storage requirements. So there's pros and cons to each workflow um, and the specifics really need to be ironed out before the lab work begins. So we do all this when we're making the initial method statement. The key really at this stage though is communication. Um, so, and we make sure we're available for questions at all times from the geotech contractor and respond really quickly um, just to make sure that nothing gets kind of Nothing happens along these steps that will get rid of the RSL potential of the core. Um, and so this has just been really key in ensuring everything moves, runs smoothly. Um, so this takes us to the point where we have the samples and I'm going to pass over to Phil here to talk more about the analysis methodology for OSL. Thanks, darling. Uh, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so the first point uh, there under the OSL analysis is uh, that the kind of conventional time dependent signal that we're working with is um, held within quartz grains and this uh, technique of uh, optically stimulated luminescence dating was developed by Dave Huntley and colleagues back in 1985 and we're typically focused on um, very particular grain fractions uh, typically the fine silt or fine sand fraction um, but the if I could have the next point please Sally um, but the maximum age uh, in quartz OSL dating in the UK is generally limited to 300,000 years. It very much depends on the individual um, uh, conditions, uh, the locations of the samples, um, but typically limited to 300,000. But we have had age estimates that have got reliably back to uh, beyond uh, 450,000 years ago. But we, as I say, we've largely been focused on quartz uh, since 1985. And actually, it wasn't the first mineral that we used in luminescence dating. Back in the 70s and late 60s, when this method was being developed, the first mineral that was isolated were, were feldspars, uh, sodium and potassium feldspars. Um, but uh, quite quickly, Anne Wintle discovered in uh, 1974 that they fade, they anomalously fade. We expect the signal to fade um, thermally with time, uh, with very, uh, very small uh, quantities um, leaking over time, but feldspars um, fade anomalously, which makes it sound like we don't understand why. We do understand why. It's just to reflect that they, they fade athermally. But without that fading, the great thing about feldspars is that they can uh, date far further back in time. Uh, their uh, signal grows with time and it saturates uh, much later uh, than the quartz. Um, so um, they've got great potential in terms of extending back across this entire period that uh, Sally has mentioned at uh, the start of this presentation. However, in 2008, um, uh, Felspars uh, returned to centre stage uh, with the discovery of a, a non-fading signal, uh, the PIRIR signal. So for quartz, we're using OSL and to help distinguish it from the fading signal or non-fading signal in potassium Felspars, uh, we gave it an entirely new name, post-infrared infrared, infrared um, luminescence dating of potassium feldspars. Um, what that did, not only what was uh, it did it give us an opportunity to extend uh, luminescence dating uh, back across this entire period that we we're interested in, but critically, um, it affords this uh, opportunity to corroborate our, our quartz OSL age estimates going back about 300 to 400,000 years ago. 
So um, we, uh, we're going to talk, Michael's going to talk about um, uh, a particular case study, and I'm just going to foreground that by talking about the range of dating that we had uh, from that case study and just show you how, how powerful this method can be. So Sally, if I can have the next slide, please. Okay, so the luminescence age estimates are based on two variables, the equivalent dose uh, divided by the dose rate. So this is the total dose that the sample has absorbed over time uh, from natural background radiation, most of it coming from the surrounding sediments, a little bit of it coming from the cosmos. Um, so the luminescence is actually not a measure of time, it's a measure of dose. And to convert that luminescence from a decimeter into a chronometer, we need to divide it by the dose rate. And we quantify the dose rate by uh, measuring the quantities of um, uh, radionuclides in surrounding sediments and looking at our position on the planet to calculate uh, the dose rate that's coming from the cosmos. But what that then provides um, is um, uh, effectively, if we're dividing equivalent dose by dose rate, then the gradient from the origin to any of these points should give us the age. So Sam, if you just want to click the next slide. So we have a, a range of age estimates coming out here. So I've got to put here is um, the lowest gradient and the highest gradient. And uh, next slide, please, Sally. And that highest gradient reflects um, whoop, that one. <laughs> the, um, the highest, uh, steepest gradient there reflects um, the oldest age estimates that we were getting out about 520,000 years ago and through to the lowest gradient there. So uh, down to about 4.3, uh, 4,300 years ago. Um, now, these are all quartz uh, OSO adjustments, and these are the ones that we uh, were using predominantly uh, within this project. And then uh, we were going to apply um, some paired dating, applying our paired feldspar, uh, applying our potassium feldspar approach to a subset of these. So we just tried it on three samples to start with to see how we how we would go. These protocols are very, although the signal was developed in two thousand and eight. I would still say this is a non-standard approach um, because uh, things are evolving, measurement protocols are evolving all uh, over time. And um, the, there's, the further we go back in time, the more machine time this takes. So there's not a huge um, evidence base uh, to you know, uh, verify that this paired approach you know, is, is working consistently. However, if we just click on the next slide, please, Sally. Okay, so we've got two axes here. We're gonna have the potassium feldspar uh, PIR, IR age on the vertical axis. We've got our quartz OSL age estimates coming out on the x-axis there. And we've got a dash line there, which uh, is basically a one-to-one -one relationship. So uh, the points that we're hoping to come out from dating both the quartz fraction and the potassium feldspar fraction in the sample should give us um, some age estimates that lie on that line. So to do the grand reveal, uh, Sally. So don't be too blown away, it's just three points to start with. But um, this is um, in luminescence terms, in the luminescence community, this is a, a really um, good um, example of paired quartz OSL and potassium feldspar dating working, where um, effectively and statistically speaking, they're, st they're giving off consistent age estimates. And remember, we're going back um, through time periods here. So we've got age ages coming out there about 70 to 80,000 years. But the further we go back in time, and certainly actually even within this time range, there are very few alternative dating techniques available, either because they don't go far back, far enough back in time, or there just isn't enough datable material. So uh, luminescence dating is really good at dating these situations because it relies on the presence of, it's an inorganic dating technique, it relies on the presence of mineral grains whose clock is essentially um, um, uh, reset by exposure to sunlight. And these age estimates are given an estimate of the, of the burial period. And our minerals are everywhere. They're naturally ubiquitous across the planet. Uh, and so, we, uh, and in particular as minerals, they are physically and chemically robust. They uh, survive the ravages of time. So luminescence dating, and in particular this paired approach is a really powerful way of getting dates um, from sediments from which uh, you can rarely use any other technique. Uh, and I think I will hand over to Michael now. Yeah, thank you very much, Phil. So to come back to where we've actually been working um, for the results that Phil's been showing, this is the, um, the north, north part of the North Sea Basin uh, with East Anglia uh, in the bottom uh, for Norfolk, and then we have Lincolnshire and um, Yorkshire on the left-hand side. And the wind farms we're working with at the moment are the 
um, the big offshore ones uh, associated with Hornsey. So the work we're presenting is Hornsey 2, which are the red lines you can see moving off the Lincolnshire coast on the left, uh, going straight through a very large uh, deep area called the um, Inner Silver Pit, um, and then out to the main array sites. And this is one of um, three main Hornsey sites that are currently in, in process where these, this sort of work has been applied. And on the right hand side, just showing you kind of the geotechnical lab. So this is working with uh, Fugro, where they've been um, putting into place these protocols. So the cores are split in site, um, visually inspected, photographed, and then you can see in the bottom right hand uh, photo there, the lab technicians are then rewrapping our cores um, so that we have them minimal exposure at the surface to light when they're being looked at, and then they are preserved as you see in the photo there, um, up until a point where we need to assess them for the potential for dating. Uh, next slide, please, Sunny. So this is the sort of uh, photographs we get from the labs. And the benefit of using this protocol over the standard approach, which was just take a few samples, send them through, and we'll try and date them at a later point, is it gives us room for maneuverability. We have an entire set of cores there, so 6.1 meters, all of which have been sampled, photographed, described, and then um, sealed back in the, let's say, polythene for light shielding. So you can actually go through and collect your, or select your optimal samples that you need for your dating. So this sample here is taken from the, um, the Western Bank of the Inner Silver Pit. It's core EC008VC, shown in the bathymetry at the top. And you can see the seismic profile just underneath it. So what this core is targeting is a very distinctive seismic unit uh, present on the edge of this area. And the cores, we can see we have these kind of laminated clay deposits um, moving all the way up to where we have a overlying till uh, deposit, so a glacial deposit, and then we're into modern marine sands and, and uh, gravels on the top. So we can select the areas that we're most interested. So this is really kind of anything from two and a half meters down to the base of the core. Select the samples and the select the locations within the samples that are optimal for dating. So that is a conversation between Sally, Phil and I. What do we want to date? Where do we want to date it from? And then also take additional samples from. And uh, next slide, please, Sally. And from this, we can generate the dates um, that we have. So Phil's already shown you some kind of nice, clear uh, scatter graphs, and I will just bamboozle you with a Bayesian model, um, which you may be familiar with if you ever look at these things, but they're not too complicated. The point with Bayesian analysis is you're just, you're just taking associations between dates, so one date must be older than another one, and you're looking at whether they are statistically um, associated with each other and how reliable that association is. So the benefit of using the pair dates is that we can do a Bayesian analysis, both comparing those two sets of dates, so the uh, potassium feldspar and the quartz dates, and then their relationship throughout the core, as you can see here. And what we end up with is a very close um, match between all of the dates, both within the pairs and between sets of pairs. And it constrains our dating considerably further because we can use this Bayesian approach. Um, which places these uh, these dates in what we would class um, on quaternary timescale as uh, marine isotope stage 5a. And this is where you're basically counting back the fluctuations in temperature over time. So marine stage 1 is where we are presently in the warm period. The last interglacial period, so last really warm period, was um, stage 5e, which is on the top left, uh, left of that graph. And we are in something called marine isotope stage 5a, which in British quaternary um, nomenclature is what we call the Brimpton interstadial. So it is a cool period named after a site in Berkshire on the Kennet Valley, um, occurring around 80,000 years. And doing additional analysis, the traditional stuff such as mollusk, pollen, foraminifera, confirms that this is a cool, um, cool climate and intertidal environment uh, present in this area. So what we have using this dating is we have very tightly constrained ages on this deposit and the nature of the deposit identified through the sedimentology and the paleoenvironmental analysis um, shows that we have a deposit which we would, uh, under the North Sea lithology structure, class is probably similar to uh, something we call a brown bank formation, which is traditionally only found in the eastern part of the North Sea, but um, from this project uh, and from some other work on wind farms in the area, as well as the Lost Frontiers project, we are finding a lot more of these kind of inter 
into um, stadial deposits much further east, west in the North Sea than was ever apparent. However, the benefit of the dating here is that we can really constrain what age these deposits are using this approach um, to around 80,000 years. And we know that these predate uh, any evidence of hominins, particularly Neanderthals, within, present within the British Isles, which um, disappear from the end of marine isotope stage seven, start of stage six, and don't really reappear until the end of marine isotope stage four, around 60,000 years. So we can tightly constrain the age of these deposits to show that, yes, these are, these are kind of a, um, a submerged paleolandscape feature. But it also it's a paleo landscape feature where we don't know of any presence of um, hominins in the area at the time uh, in the past and certainly not in the British Isles. So the dating really confirms that, yes, it's a really interesting deposit. But from an archaeological perspective, the chance of recovering anything from these deposits is very, very low because these aren't normally found, have never been found in this country, apart from a couple of speculative um, sites in Kent. Next slide, please. So really to conclude what we're, we're trying to uh, present here is that by using these, the innovative sampling methodologies, so working with the labs, being pro proactive and actually having protocols in place from the very point of taking that core from the ground and protecting samples, it allows us to do a lot more work with dating and working with these labs um, to give us a much wider range of deposits that we can date and also then protecting samples so that we have those options to date them uh, as and when we make a decision that these yes these are the primary um, deposits that we really want to understand in the past everything has been based on seismic interpretations to very broad um, stratigraphic units um, but we never really knew what age they were, apart from this unit is older than this unit or younger than that unit. Now we can go in and really kind of tighten up the ages of when things were happening in the North Sea Basin uh, and really kind of understand what the archaeological implications of these submerged landscapes are and when they occurred. And the approach using here of the paired mineral dating really increases our certainty of the age estimates. In the past, a lot of work has been kind of slightly more sporadic OSL dating using quartz fraction. And often you have dates where you have, say, a number of caveats that, you know, these could be minimal, minimal age estimates, but the age could be much older. Using a paired approach gives us much more certainty in the age of these um, deposits. And therefore, we can do an awful lot more on the interpretation and really tie things in. Um, and as a result, by kind of using these, these new approaches um, and, the, and the results that we're gaining from them, um, we can have a much better understanding of the past history of the North Sea Pelia landscapes and what really exists out there and when they were present. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for listening, everyone. Um, and yeah, just to say thank you to, to Orsted for allowing us to present on Hornsey 2 and thanks also to, his, also to Historic England for inputting the method statement stage. Um, thank you. Has anyone got any questions? That's great, Sally, Michael and Phil. Thank you very much for presenting. That was incredibly interesting. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you can keep uh, popping them through um, and if we don't have time for them this bit, we can, we can go through them at the end. Uh, we've got a question in, uh, which says, thank you very much for the insights. Uh, OSL looks very handy, especially using paired samples and Bayesian modelling. Is there more likelihood or risk of contamination of waterlogged samples compared to non-waterlogged samples, depending on the nature of the type of waterlogging, either e.g. Uh, seawater or freshwater? Can I pass that on to you, Phil? Yeah, sure. Um, it's not um, really a problem in terms of the nature of the water, but it is um, in terms of what uh, Sally was talking about in terms of sampling. Um, I, it, I think she made it sound grander than, than it actually is. Essentially, if the, if the sample integrity and the texture of the sample is enough to hold it together, um, that's what we were. That's what we rely on. So, if you've got a very sandy deposit and which has got a lot of water in it, and that's going to collapse as soon as we open it, then obviously that's that's no good uh, good for us. So, we do need the the sample essentially to we are relying on it holding itself together and to have a core effectively of the core material uh, that hasn't seen the light of day. So, not necessarily the nature of the water, but mainly the interaction of water and the texture of the sediment is key to successful sampling. That's great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, hopefully that's the, the question answered. Uh, I've just got a very quick one as well. Is uh, with We've mentioned a change in methodology for how cores are collected and uh, effectively 
stored and processed um, with, with different liners, et cetera. How has this been received by the contractors that are actually undertaking this work? Because um, it's obviously a, it's a bit of a change for them. And, and is this, does using uh, this, this new methodology, does it have a significant financial impact to the contractor or to the client ultimately? Uh, yeah, I'll go for that one. It, it's, it tends to be fine because, because we have the detailed chats with them before they even go out and collect their cause. We work out what their plans are and then there are normally ways that we can just fit the workflows around to, to suit whatever it is that they're planning on doing. So no, there's no cost implication. There, there is sometimes when they've got more limited storage, um, they opt for one workflow over another workflow, um, but that's all, that's all agreed kind of ahead of time. So it's fine. That's great. Thank you very much, Sally. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks very much, guys. So I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who is Graham Scott, and his presentation is on using the new generation of low-cost battery-powered ROVs for subsea archaeological work. So over to you, Graham. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak at the uh, CIFA Innovation Festival. Worked for the Heritage Charity and Contractor Wessex Archaeology in senior operational role as a marine archaeologist since 2003, working uh, with both divers and ROVs of all sizes. Oh, it's only in the last few years that I've been a self-taught ROV pilot. Exploiting the opportunity provided by what this paper is about, a new generation of battery-powered ROVs. These have the potential to have a significant impact upon how uh, maritime archaeology is conducted. I'll consider the pros and cons by examining practical experience of their use on two sites where we undertook subsea survey in 2019. The far northwest of Scotland, we were asked by Historic Environment Scotland to resurvey the wreck of a ship thought to have been lost in the 1590s or the first half of the 1600s, ship possibly connected with the trade between uh, the Iberian Peninsula and the uh, Low Countries. The purpose of this survey was to monitor the site's condition. Secondly, uh, we were asked by Historic England to carry out an investigation of the wreck of a 19th century merchant sailing ship in the Bristol Channel that had not previously been subject to a detailed archaeological survey. This wreck here, the purpose of this work was to advise the client about whether to designate the wreck. And this ship, the South Australian, was a veteran of the colonial trade between, surprise, surprise, South Australia and Britain. But um, by the time of its loss in 1889, it was old and working as a tramp. On its last voyage, it was taking railway track from South Wales uh, to the expanding railway network of post-independence Argentina, post-independence, post-Civil War Argentina. Some of this cargo broke free in a gale and forced open a side cargo door, causing it to flood and uh, founder and taking with it, sadly, the Jamaican cook. Now, archaeologists were, of course, fairly early adopters of marine geophysical survey techniques to locate historic shipwrecks. In the case of the South Australian, there was existing public multi-beam swath bathymetry data, and we were able to acquire side scan sonar data during previous uh, work. So did this tell us enough about the wreck to meet the client's objectives? Well, no. You can see in the multi-beam the huge stack of iron rails that form the cargo survives. And you can see individual rails in the stack, parts of which are clearly disordered. Uh, but the geophysics didn't answer questions about what survives of the ship itself. And an eyeball on the site was therefore needed. How we did that and whether archaeologists will carry out future investigations from the comfort of a vessel survey room or will continue to jump over the side and get wet is the theme of this presentation. Now, archaeology underwater has traditionally been carried out using divers. This is me on HMS Montague, a battleship. I'm about my will I so I am about to, my fins are about to get ambushed. Um, divers breathing compressed air or oxygen enriched air down to a limit of roughly 30 to 50 meters depth and using mainly recreational or 
recreational or military der derived scuba equipment. Since the 1990s, much cheaper techniques of mixed gas and rebreather diving have gradually been adopted. So much cheaper, much cheaper than the alternative of uh, commercial saturation diving. Um, and these have been adopted by some archaeologists to enable them to reach greater depths and to dive shallower for longer. Now, diving longer or deeper is inherently uh, rather inefficient because time has to be devoted to the process of slow ascent if the diver is to avoid decompression illness. Furthermore, whilst it's easy to overstate this, diving at depth is ine inevitably rather riskier. The depth of the South Australian working time for divers can be measured in minutes unless lengthy periods are spent decompressing and not working. Divers also subject to the narcotic-like effects of nitrogen and UK regulations concerning decompression diving would have imposed a very considerable cost uh, burden on the work. Now, whilst the use of more advanced diving techniques would have produced more working time, uh, solving uh, some of the problems, this would not have been a perfect solution and would have imposed additional risks. So what solution was used and how well did it work? Well, the usual alternative to divers is, of course, the remotely operated vehicle or ROV, a form of uncrewed submersible. ROV is not a robot in that it is not autonomous. It is controlled from the surface by means of a cable. Originally introduced in the 1950s, initially unreliable, these subsea vehicles have since become pretty much ubiquitous uh, following uh, adoption by the oil and gas industry. They've got a theoretically unlimited underwater endurance, they're able uh, to operate much greater depth and they're not subject to decompression requirements. And they are the de facto choice for many tasks previously carried out by divers in the offshore energy business. Now, archaeologists have been fairly slow to adopt ROV technology, lack of familiarity, lack of relevant technical skills, and arguably the adventurous job satisfaction that leads archaeologists to want to dive in the first place have all played a part. The high capital and operating costs have also been a major disincentive. This is an example of type of large ROV used in the offshore wind sector, likely to be deployed by the client on any anomaly of archaeological potential discovered during pre-construction investigations. More than enough capability, but uh, about one and a half million to buy second hand, plus the operating costs, a large team, and of course the cost of chartering the vessel, which are never small. Here's an offshore industry standard small ROV, a CI Falcon here deployed by ourselves in the MOD to investigate the wrecks of two American landing ships lost during an allied practice exercise for D-Day, Exercise Tiger. Whilst it's more deployable and about the same cost as a professional dive, dive team, it still has a high capital entry cost, around 100,000 with a full set of spurs. Even the smallest and most basic traditional ROVs, those powered from the, when I say traditional, those powered from the surface using a combined power and comms cable, have an entry price new of about 15,000 um, and very swiftly upwards. And as a low margin archaeological contractor wanting them only for a few days, you are usually at the back of uh, the queue for the limited rental pool of vehicles. Uh, right. However, into this void in the last few years and drawing inspiration from robotics, drone and LiPo battery technology have come a new generation of battery powered ROVs. A price point between one and one, sorry, between half and one third or less that of a surface powered equivalents. Uh, the Blue Rov 2, a well-known example is typical of the type, benefits from a modular and flexible configuration and can mount a surprisingly heavy and bulky payload. Total weight of 11 and a half uh, kilograms in uh, means that it can be deployed by hand and it has a higher high power to weight ratio. 
with a maximum forward speed of about three knots, uh, it can quite comfortably outswim a diver. Also has good stability and maneuverability. The use of an internal 14.8 uh, volt battery means that the cable connecting it to the vessel is significantly lighter and slimmer than it would be if it had to carry power, largely avoiding the drag issues that can bedevil small ROVs. On the South Australian site, we were comfortably achieving 45 to 60 minutes before battery change with seabed to seabed taking about 10 minutes. The compact and simple nature of the ROV, controlled from your own laptop, meant that it was operational on the day the project was mobilized, which is important for short, cost-conscious operations such as this, and not something that can often be said of operations involving much larger ROVs. So did this vehicle do what we needed it to do on the South Australia? Well, generally, yes. To find the site and record the survey against the base mapping provided by the Jib Physics, we used an ultra short baseline or USBL acoustic positioning system. We've been using those for the best part of two decades uh, and fitting the acoustic transponder to its frame. Um, ROVs provide a, a pretty stable platform for that type of positioning system, uh, better usually than most divers. Now the movement of the ROV is shown here, superimposed onto the multi-beam data and buffered by the underwater visibility to give an approximate survey extent. Use of a GIS linked database enables features of particular archaeological interest to be recorded as database entries synchronized with the video, for example. So did the ROV meet the requirement of providing information not contained in the existing geophysics? Again, the answer is yes. Its full HD color video camera displays on a surface monitor. In addition, it's provided with dedicated mounts for GoPro type action cameras. And we operated up to two of these shooting 4K video or time-lapse stills. Now at 43 to 48 meters in the Bristol Channel, there is a little light from the surface and artificial lighting was required. I, I didn't have a low light camera, such as you can see in the background beha behind me. Although the onboard uh, 1500 lumen LED lights provided reasonable lighting close up, the visibility did actually prove to be excellent. It was necessary to add a battery powered 15,000 lumen video light to fully exploit this. Again, the ROV handled this well. Now, being small in size and maneuverable, the ROV could get in close to some delicate features. The above bed structure of the ship has disappeared, but the ROV located the longitudinal edge of the surviving hull under the edge of the cargo in Scour. Here you can see the iron frames and timber planking. This type of composite uh, construction looked at from an outboard angle and below. These images are not spectacular, but they do the job. Now, the presence of rails in this form of ship construction was clear archaeological evidence that the identification of the wreck was correct. Here you can see disordered rails. I think I've actually got to show you that one for the disordered rails. In fact, the one on the top left is rather more ordered. We can see these disordered rails but the cargo door that was breached hasn't survived being above bed level. Nevertheless, this is archaeological evidence supporting the contemporary accounts of how the ship was lost. Here is a winch to the southwest. Visual survey identified anchors at the northeast end, uh, suggesting that uh, the bow, this is the winch again, sorry, the, suggesting that the bow of the vessel is that end. However, we do not know exactly how far the surviving hull extends under the bow and stern because nothing was visible on the surface. This is an obvious weakness of such a small ROV, which is unable to carry the bulky and heavy equipment of a dredge or jetting tool or easily use a probe. Another weakness was the difficulty in measuring and scaling anything. You will see that there are no scale, there were no scales in the photographs you saw, and we 
didn't actually achieve any measurements such as the width of frames and planks and the dimensions of uh, the winch. Possible future solutions include the use of a laser scaler. This one is manufactured for the ROV. Um, uh, a scale deployed by a manipulator. Again, this is the one manufactured for the ROV, very simple, a single function. And imaging sonar, ROV is now fitted with a small sonar designed for it, but uh, uh, pretty good, not brilliant, but pretty good. High resolution sonar is starting, imaging sonar is starting to become available. Now the open architecture and the modular construction of the ROV uses a Raspberry Pi computer and a simple PixHawk autopilot uh, makes it easy for this equipment to be added if you've got even just a, a modicum of, of uh, uh, technical knowledge. Despite these issues, all the objectives were achieved uh, with a tracked visual search of the whole wreck and its debris field being achieved in a total in water time of just three and a quarter hours. So overall, I think a success. Now, the second site that we used the ROV on was rather different. Little survives of the Kinloch Burby vessel, which lies partly at the base of an underwater cliff very close to the shore. You imagine not a good place to be in a storm. The wreck had already been surveyed and partially excavated between 1997 and 2003. It is a traditional drawn plan of the area, the base of the cliff, where wreck material uh, fell after the ship struck the top of the cliff. The wreck had already received legal protection, but has had little recent data, so required a condition survey. The work we did allowed us also to test the suitability of the ROV for photogrammetry. A two-person team was deployed operating the ROV from a small 10-metre support vessel. First task was a general and close visual survey. Here are the two small cast iron cannons at the bottom of the cliff. Again, no scale, but this was a comparative condition survey and measurements were already available. And here uh, are the anchors. These have the typical light build of a 16th century wrought uh, iron anchor. Having completed the GVI and the CVI, we then undertook photogrammetry, first of the area in the existing drawn site plan. Did it work? Well, once again, I think you can see from this, the answer is yes. Fine maneuvering was essential and was easy to achieve. It's a small ROV and rather than use a large DSLR, you can do, but rather than doing that, we used the most recent GoPro model. This was set to take time-lapse photographs at one second intervals and good coverage was achieved within about 40 to 45 minutes, if I recall correctly. And a model was available on site a, a few hours later using uh, mobilized uh, graphics computer, uh, graphics laptop. Uh, that's just another image of it. And again, so you can see the detail. I'm sure you've seen all sorts of images like this from all sorts of sites. Now, the speed of this survey gave us the time to exploit the ROV's stability and its depth holding mode to undertake a photogrammetric survey of a much wider area, something that had not been achieved before to any real level of detail. For this, we flew over the seabed in lanes, guided by USBL to ensure sufficient overlap appreciate that this sort of slope can be quite difficult to navigate on at times. Uh, two GoPros were used to reduce the survey time, although the aft facing camera was an older model, uh, only one uh, uh, model older, but the photographs were too affected by motion blur to be used, which was a, a very useful lesson, perhaps something that we shouldn't have needed a lesson on, but there we go, it was a lesson. Again, this only took a single 45 minute dive. And before operations on site had been completed, the model had been converted into a drawn site plan using a, a simple iPad drawing app. And subsequently, the model was geo-referenced and this depth map of the site was produced. 
Now, quite a lot of ceramics, including fine Italian maiolica ware, had been found during initial e excavations. Small pockets of sand were mapped during the photogrammetry survey. A dive was therefore spent closely examining these uh, sand pockets and further fragments of ceramic were found and positioned. However, we couldn't pick them up to examine uh, them due to the lack of a, a manipulator at the time. Now, this site also expressed another weakness of the ROV in terms of archaeological survey. Uh, the area of the site you can see uh, to the south, I really ought to give you the image, um, uh, to the south uh, uh, be below the uh, depth map, um, formed a shallow shelf between the submerged cliff and the shore. And being shallow, it was very densely covered in kelp. Because attempting to penetrate this would have resulted pretty certainly in entanglement, we were unable to relocate artifacts that had previously been found there by divers. Nevertheless, it would be hard to argue that this survey overall was not a success. So to summarize, what have these surveys taught us about the usefulness of small battery powered ROVs for archaeological work underwater? The main positives are obvious, capital and operating costs, massively cheaper to buy. They also require a team of only one or two to operate as against four or five for diving. Owning your own gives you time to practice encourages innovation and avoids the supply issues that can be experienced when renting. I would say to you, if you're contemplating using these type of vehicles, don't underestimate the latter. In terms of, um, well, uh, sorry, I should say they, um, the third positive is survey capability. Despite its small size, the Blue Rov is a capable and it's a stable and highly maneuverable vehicle, can survey quickly and it can mount an impressive uh, array uh, and increasing array of equipment. It's very easy to fly and maintain. It takes some experience to get the best out of it, but it doesn't require any advanced technical knowledge. In terms of development potential, it has an open and modular architecture that encourages uh, its development um, and that of equipment um, associated with it, whether it be low cost or high cost, in which case you're going to have to try to rent probably. Sonar makes um, very low visibility operation of the ROV much more practical, as well as greatly enhancing beyond visual range capability. And the use of a laptop as the surface interface also opens up a world of possibilities in terms of remote access. Now, last but not least, it is safe. This is becoming more important and represents subsea future proofing, uh, particularly if the current client trend for avoiding using divers widens and perhaps accelerates. So what are the question marks over this type of ROV? Well, endurance is an obvious question, although I have to say it's no, not so far been a problem. No ROV has the close situational awareness and dexterity of a diver, and this type of ROV will always be vulnerable to becoming trapped in complex environments. There are important tasks such as measurement that a small ROV such as this may, and I say may, always struggle with, and there will probably always be tasks that it they are not suited to underwater excavation and the handling of delicate archaeological finds being the most obvious. There may also be a pro diver bias, although ROVs, I would say, may help retain very experienced older archaeologists in an operational role. And you see I'm uh, smiling there. The Blue Rov is not yet a deep water machine although it is rated to 100 meters and these machines will eventually go much deeper, I am sure. 
So I hope I've given you a flavor of our practical experience using these new tools, which are probably here to stay. If their capabilities continue to improve and expand, then they may well replace divers for many archeological tasks. If so, then they will be an ROV revolution. Of course, traditional ROVs controlled from the surface via a cable are themselves coming under pressure from the rise of autonomous vehicles, and we have started to use the latter. If they eventually come down in price in the same way, then this ROV revolution may in fact quickly turn into an AUV revolution. Regardless, it's onwards and downwards, I hope. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Graham. Uh, that was incredibly interesting. Uh, I was desperately trying to think of a question to ask you on this one, but uh, it, it was covered. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to make an no awkward question. questions, please. Well, I can, I can try and think of an awkward one if you like, but um, I'm, I'm just going to make an observation, Graham, and it, it, it's two parts. They are phenomenal. Um, the, the, the blue ROVs and, and everything Graham said, I completely agree with. Um, it, it is quite hard for me as a diver and a diving contractor to listen to that presentation because th there is going to become a point i think where we are going to get replaced um at least for a fair few of the tasks we do um so it's kind of a bittersweet listening to that presentation but um no thank, thank you very much it was incredibly informative if anyone has any questions for graham going forward if you pop them in there the q a session and we can we can get to them at the end but thank you graham yeah, so much for coming back to our session on technology and methodology in marine archaeology for the CEPA Innovation Festival. So this is the second half of our session, the first session of the day. Um, we've got a presentation by Alison James on protecting underwater cultural, her cultural heritage forensically. So if you'd like to kick off, Alison. Thank you. You can hopefully all see my screen now. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm delighted to be able to be here today to tell you about this project. It's been a long time um, in development. Some of you here today know me and know that I spent 10 years before I worked at MSCS working for Historic England. Now, towards the end of my time there, I was responsible for helping to develop this project. And it really grew out of a frustration that we didn't have all the tools we needed to effectively manage England's protected wreck sites. I attended a heritage crime conference at Leeds Castle in 2017 and was so jealous of all the products like Smart Water that were being used to help protect terrestrial heritage assets. Um, I'm now delighted to be involved with the project from the MSDS Marine side of things. The project is funded by Historic England and the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands, who I will today call by their initials RCE, but more of that in a minute. First of all, why was this project needed in the first place? Well, there was a series of high profile cases that led to the need to act. So in 2010, the torpedo loading hatch from the remains of the protected wreck submarine Holland 5 um, was noticed to be missing and presumed stolen. The wreck uh, was sunk off Sussex in 1912 and has been there very happily for quite a while. Uh, but then this theft happened. And then in around 2015, 2016, uh, we noticed that a unique bronze cannon had been taken from a protected historic wreck site off Dunwich in Suffolk. The whereabouts of both the hatch and the cannon are presently unknown, and it, it, it was incredibly frustrating. In addition, Historic England had a number of reports of attempted crimes relating to protected wreck sites elsewhere. One notable area had been within the Kent Heritage Watch area on the Goodwin Sands, where divers had been observed seemingly preparing to dive protected wreck sites. And intelligence had suggested in the past that the sites were being deliberately targeted, even with reports of divers traveling over from Europe to target the sites um, specifically. Since the loss of these items um, and due to the ongoing intelligence, Historic England became increasingly concerned over the security of protected wreck sites, especially sites where you had bronze cannon or other high valuable or collectible material that let, was left on the seabed, as well as sites, um, things like the Colossus, where you have smaller artifacts that are particularly attractive in respect of unlawful souvenir hunting. They're incredibly easy for a diver to slip into their pocket while they're on the site. 
I do want to say before I go much further, it's not all doom and gloom in terms of heritage crime. We've come a huge way talking about marine heritage crime in the last 10 to 15 years. I remember in my early days at HE having to report that torpedo loading hatch uh, theft to Sussex Police. My first attempt was a disaster. The call handler wanted to know if they needed to get anti-terrorism involved if a torpedo had been stolen. And then they wanted to give me my crime reference number for my insurance claim, which clearly wasn't what I needed. Um, and in fact, I ended up hanging up on the call handler and starting again. So my second attempt followed a long preparation session with Mark Harrison, who's head of heritage crime at Historic England, who gave me essentially a script to follow uh, with important information, such as the Home Office reporting code and the police heritage crime lead for the area. And this put me on a more level playing field with the call handler and enabled us to talk the same language, which is incredibly important uh, with heritage crime. What followed next was a series of high profile marine heritage crime success stories, notably the London investigation that resulted in a prosecution. But there are still huge frustrations um, around high value and collectible materials on the seabed. If you go on eBay today, I suspect you'll find a number of items that have come from protected rec sites, even if they don't explicitly say so. I can't begin to tell you how frustrating this is when trying to look after the sites. Um, I'm no longer at Historic England. The sites and looking after them isn't my responsibility anymore, but I still find it incredibly frustrating seeing this material out there. So what happened next? Well, in 2017, Historic England requested submissions for a project to develop and apply forensic markings to artefacts on four protected rec sites as part of a tender process. And this very much followed on from the Leeds Castle event um, and my jealousy that uh, our terrestrial colleagues had always tools at their disposal. The project that Historic England envisaged, it sought to engage with and help communities and volunteers care for marine heritage assets. Um, and MSDS Marine won the tender process and took the project forward. But what happened in uh, the following year, so in summer 2018, there were a series of really high profile cases of Dutch war losses in international waters, notably those in the Java Sea uh, being targeted by commercial salvers. Um, when I say targeted by commercial salvers, they were literally stripping the wrecks from the seabed that there was no wreck material left by the time they'd finished. And RCE began to investigate the possibility of forensic marking solutions as well. And they identified that our project was underway and a sensible solution would be to join forces to allow stronger, uh, more robust products to be developed. So they joined the project team officially in April 2019. And the project design was updated to allow further testing um, and development of the markers, including more environmental testing and the development of a method of application more suitable to large scale sites, because that's where the Dutch's interest sort of lies primarily. And I'll, I'll come on to that slightly later on. So the project had four main aims. Uh, we wanted to identify the best way of protectively marking underwater cultural material. Um, and that's where developing a forensic marking solution is relevant. Uh, we wanted to provide an effective deterrent and to prevent unlawful removal or damage to historic wrecks. And um, providing this deterrent is a huge part of our project. We don't want the illegal activity to even happen in the first place. And I'll come on to that in a moment. We wanted to provide law enforcement agencies with the ability to accurately identify the provenance of objects or artifacts that have been recovered. Uh, so when the police, for example, are undertaking their criminal investigation, it's one thing for them to be able to go and recover the artifacts out of uh, people's garages or wherever else they may be stored. And realistically, we probably know where they come from, but it's completely another thing to be able to prove where they came from beyond any reasonable doubt. And that's what we want to get to. Um, and the final aim was to engage with and help communities and volunteers care for marine heritage assets. I'll mention this later on, but I do want to flag at this time that my colleague Jenny Kent is also talking in this afternoon's marine session about involving the community with marine heritage crime prevention through our site security champion scheme in partnership with the Protected Wreck Association, thanks to funding from Historic England. So if you're not planning on going this afternoon, you should do to go and see how, what Jenny's talking about. So. I've already said that we don't want the illegal activity to happen in the first place, and we really don't. And this is where this slide comes in. Now, interdiction is a military term for the act of delaying, disrupting or destroying enemy forces or supplies en route to the battlefield. Now, 
where we are now with marine heritage crime, we're not on a battlefield. It might feel like it occasionally, but the term has been adopted by the police force to describe the points at which a crime can be stopped. And these steps are important, not just in policing, but in the prevention of heritage, heritage crime. So I'm just going to go through them slightly and see how they relate to this project. Well, stage one is the conspiracy stage, which includes planning and the procurement of equipment. So this could include uh, the salvers or the divers chartering a vessel, the preparation of dive equipment, uh, the preparation and sourcing of lifting equipment, discussions with other divers or vessel skippers uh, who have got knowledge about the site and artifacts. Once they've done that, it leads to the next stage, which is going to the scene. And this includes leaving your accommodation, meeting up with other members of the team, traveling to the vessel, heading to the site. Um, it can also include traveling from the surface to the wreck site, which is particularly relevant when access to the site is unauthorized, such as on a protected wreck site. Once they've got to the scene, they get to stage three, which is the actual act of committing the crime. So this is the physical act of the unauthorised removal of wreck, uh, wreck material or artefacts from the seabed, as well as their recovery, which in most instances uh, is they will recover the material and take it onto the vessel. Once they've done that, you're on stage four, which is leaving the scene. And this is the period of time from leaving the site to the storage of the material and includes the time on the vessel, unloading the material, transporting it to the storage location. Stage five, therefore, is storage. So in most instances, the recovered wreck material will be stored for a period of time. It may be hours, it may be weeks, it may be indefinitely. It all very much depends on what's going to happen next and to a certain extent on the motivations of the divers. Are they doing it uh, because they're collectors? Are they doing it because they want to make a profit? So the final stage is investigating the benefits and disposal. So where the wreck material has been recovered for financial gain, um, and the recoveries are not intending it to remain in their possession, the likely final stage in their involvement is the investigation of the onward receiver, um, if it's not already known, and the investigation of the wreck materials, financial or historical worth. And this could include investigations by um, the recoveries into the provenance, other examples or value. So looking at auction houses, looking at scrap metal dealers, looking at museums and seeing what the material they've recovered is worth. So why is this important? Well, by understanding when a crime could potentially be stopped, appropriate methods can be devised to either prevent the crime or aid in the capture and prosecution process and the ultimate recovery of the wreck material. So the aim of our project is to really increase the chance of being captured at all stages, making the act of heritage crime too risky, too difficult or too costly. Thus, the likely or desirable outcome is that crime will not pass uh, progress past stage one. So they'll think about the conspiracy stage and then see that there's these preventative um, forensic markings in place, which mean that they actually don't want to go to the next step. The basis for the project is that through the effective dissemination of the protective marking scheme, the criminal fraternity will be more cautious as the awareness of the chances of being linked to a crime will increase. This applies to not only the conspirators and recoveries, but also the onward chain, including the final owner, be that a private individual or a scrap metal dealer or someone else. It's hoped that the protective marking scheme will provide an effective deterrent that stops criminals carrying out a crime. Through the effective engagement of the local community, including recreational divers, town councils, harbour authorities, marina users, community archaeology groups and many others, the awareness of this type of heritage crime will be increased and an increase in awareness can lead to an increase in vigilance and the reporting of suspicious or unusual behaviour. With more intelligence being fed to the authorities, the risk of being captured is again increased. So through the effective development and implement start again, an implementation of a marking scheme for underwater wreck material, the chances of being prosecuted will also increase. So an effective marking scheme will intrinsically link the recovered wreck material to the site from which it originated and uh, as well as linking it to those involved uh, to the wreck material and to the site. So it's about completing that chain of evidence. So what have we been doing since 2017? It seems like a long time ago now. Well, we've been developing a product in that time and we've now got two products that have been deployed in the UK for testing and proven to work. 
development has been difficult. And if development hadn't been difficult, it would have been done before. Uh, we always knew it was going to be difficult. There's a lot of unknowns. We're working in the marine environment um, and we're using cutting edge technology. I have to be honest as well, a global pandemic hasn't helped speed things up either. That certainly slowed us down for a while. The product had to be suitable for deployment underwater, both in terms of durability and environmental friendliness. Two different products with several variations on them were developed at the same time. So I think we had about 20 different uh, products at one stage, all of which fulfilled the brief, but they had different application methods, different characteristics, and potentially more specific suitability for different sites and environments. We recognise that developing these two products gave us more options in the long run and provided two methods for enforcement agencies to identify. The thinking is that the production and use of two different methods will make detection and avoidance harder, thus potentially further decreasing heritage crime in future. At this stage, um, I would love to be able to tell you more about the products and show you some really cool images of it in action, but I can't. So instead, you've got a, a blurry image of the goo. Keeping the exact methods of deployment and composition of the product secret is important for now to help ensure we have the best chance of success with detection and prosecution in future. It feels really strange talking to you all about something I can't actually talk about, so you're going to have to bear with me slightly. What I can say, though, is that both products are stable, they're both environmentally friendly, they're easy to apply, and they're easy for law enforcement officers to identify. Ease of application and cost has been considered throughout the development. Uh, we know that getting divers on the seabed is expensive. We need to be able to do it quickly. We also know that heritage agencies have limited budgets. There's no point developing something that's going to be hugely costly if they can't actually use it because of cost. Both products can be used by enforcement agencies to establish if artifacts have come from a particular wreck. Um, there will be wreck specific sort of versions of them and if divers have been in contact with that wreck. We will be trialing uh, the methods on four protected wreck sites in the UK in 2022, as well as sites selected by the Dutch in future, possibly next year, possibly in years to come. So where are we now? Well, both products have undergone vigorous testing in a marine saltwater environment. Uh, for over four months uh, for both of them. And the best bit is they both work, which we are delighted about. Um, it was a nerve wracking four months waiting to recover the samples, but they worked. We have two products that have now been identified as the best ones to take forward to full development. They're durable, they're easily identifiable um, and enforcement officials will be able to recognize them. Most importantly for their future development and application, we have safety data sheets and environmental toxicology reporting that has been developed for both products that have shown the product is safe for use in the marine environment. Uh, we don't want to be killing any marine animals in the course of protecting heritage, which has been an important part of our development process. I'm told the products are essentially food safe, but we haven't put that to test in the office and we won't be doing any time soon. So what are our two methods and how do we use them? Well, both products can be deployed by a diver. Uh, you don't need any specialist equipment at all. This will allow for targeted deployment on items of commercial high value. Again, I can't tell you much more about the specifics of deployment at this stage, but what I can say is it will be easy and quick. As well as diver deployments, as well as our divers going down and popping these are things on the sites. We're also developing a method to cover large areas quickly. Uh, this is currently in development and will undergo testing in due course. The interest of RCE stems from the large scale destruction of Dutch war losses through the action of commercial salvers targeting the wrecks for their scrap value, where they literally are taking whole wrecks off the seabed. The normal method of deployment is targeted. So you would put it on items of high commercial value within a wreck site. The method of deployment by divers would be unsuitable for large scale sites just simply because of time. The investment from the Dutch has allowed for the development of a method that will allow rapid deployment on large deep water sites. It's envisaged this may take the form of biodegradable packages suitable for deployment by ROV, uh, which comes back to Graham's talk earlier on. However, the exact methods will be identified in due course. As part of the project, we will be delivering training for enforcement authorities, including police heritage crime officers, harbour authorities, coast guard officers, um, and officers from the marine management organisation. 
We'll be giving them training to show them how to identify the forensic marking as being present uh, and giving them the skills they need to collect evidence to successfully obtain prosecutions. So that's all I can tell you for now. Um, it's been difficult to talk to you something talk to you about something that I can't really tell you much about, but I am hopeful testing um, on four actual sites will commence in spring 2022. The success of this project will only be seen in years to come, and I really am looking forward to the day I can stand here again, hopefully in person next time, because it'd be very nice to see a few people and tell you all about our first successful prosecution. I think everyone involved is going to be rather delighted and rather pleased when that day comes. So hopefully it won't be too long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. That is incredibly informative. Um, it does sound like it's potentially a bit of a, a game changer in the, the fight against heritage crime. Uh, and appreciate you can't say much more now, but I'm sure we're all looking forward to, to hearing about the outcomes in next year, year after maybe. Um, so yeah, so uh, one question for you. Um, is the, the way you've described the, the product and what it does is is there similarities between the the ethos and, and the methodology for prosecution i guess with um with, with the terrestrial uh terrestrial tools such as smart water that's used on on the lead and church roofs yeah I, I can't say too much because until we get that first prosecution we want to keep it as tight as as possible but yeah it's, it's all about chain of evidence so forensically being able to tie somebody or an artifact back to that site so it, it's all about getting the chain so that you can tie it tie it up in court very much like smart water excellent thank you very much okay it looks like we've got no further questions on this point but if you do have any questions again please put them in the q a and we can look at answering them later we have blocked out a bit of time at the end of this session for some extra questions if need be so we'll move on to our next presentation, which is by Dr. Rodrigo Ortiz. Um, it's titled An Integrated Methodology to Record Invincible. So take it away, Rodrigo. Well, hi, everyone. I'm just going to introduce myself really quickly for those that don't know me. Um, I'm currently a research fellow at, based at the University of Southampton. But throughout the past eight years, I've been lucky enough to be working with different people, such as MSDS Marine, uh, Bournemouth Uni, uh, a whole several sorts of uh, universities here. So what I'm presenting today is part of my PhD research that concluded a couple of years ago, but we're still going through the analysis of all the stuff that we've been recording on Invincible and integrating. Um, that really takes a lot, a lot of research and effort. So this is still a work in progress, but I'm really happy to present some of this stuff today here. And going back to the first presentation from today, um, going back to multi-beam data that Mark was explaining, how you can get different resolution data sets and how we've been improving these, these, uh, these, this resolution on data sets really does have an impact on how we understand sites. And, and that's what, something I want to, um, yeah, I want to put, put uh, forward in, during this presentation. How much does it actually affect how we understand the sites? And the only way of actually understanding completely a site is integrating the best of different type of surveys and and uh, how we can combine this to interpret the sites, because there is no perfect technique to actually portray what's happening under the water. So as you see in, on this image, it's, it's the same data set, but it's just displayed in a different type of software and you have better resolution and that means you can interpret the site a lot better. So during this presentation, I'm going to focus on a critical use of the re of recording methods that we've been we've been using throughout the years and the things that we're using now. How we can integrate these into multiple time series or time series data, where you look at a 4D that means portray things in 3D plus a time um, component. How we produce different type of things, qualitative and quantitative analysis. So it's not just a pretty picture. You also have a lot of numbers behind it, so you can monitor sites. And how there's different ways of integrating remote sensing techniques. And how we've, we've been innovating with uh, all sorts of different platforms, not just using GIS or maybe site recorder stuff. Uh, also looking how to present this to, to the general public and other type of uh, 
of fields of research, which is really important. Sometimes we, we just focus sometimes only on, on papers and we got to think about the general public. So I really like this quote from Colin Martin. He points out that no rec site formation process is the same since the complex, uh, yeah, there's a very complex uh, interacting variables basically that the environment surrounding the, the these wrecks is completely different so it is very difficult to site tailor a methodology for a single site that will work on all of them so what i'm trying to come across is each site is different and that in because of the difference in sites you can't just say okay i'm going to only use rovs or i'm only going to use usbl systems or i'm only going to use multi -B. there's a whole series of techniques that really bring together and show the light of, of the wreck because you can't use all techniques on all sites. And coming across um, all sorts of different type of survey methods, well, do we use traditional methods or do we use new methods of recording? And I think they're really complementary between each other. I like this image um, from the top right that I took from drawn by Graham Scott, and it's from the NAS manual because it's actually exactly the same image of um, back in 2013 when I, I joined the Invincible project and we we're using planning frames to record um, the site before we started using extensively photogrammetry. So how, how can we integrate all these traditional recording methods with, with the current ones? I think that's, that's a really interesting um, question to, to look forward to. So if you analyze looking at something like a composite plan on on Invincible, this you have to you have to look at it from a critical point of view. This took a lot of effort from several weeks, several divers, and to produce this type of site plan, um, there's a lot of a lot of work behind it. Also, there's a lot of cap compound errors that you have to take in consideration. So, if you think about the previous image, where you have a single diver looking at a little square grid, where you have one by one meter, and then you have to multiply that by eight divers putting together a line and that's one season and then you have a different season and then you're trying to put together all these different it's like a puzzle basically so how accurate is this site plan well it just depends on the type of techniques and you have added errors in different stages so even though the, these are fantastic they do have a compound error and that's the interesting part that you have to analyze what are the pros and cons of each techniques we'll go to this a little bit further on um, yeah, so resolution of data sets really comes down to the, to the scale that you want to approach things. So maybe you want to cover a large area and you're going to use a multi-beam echo sound like the stuff that Mark James was presenting in the first, um, in the first presentation, you will cover what's happening with the environment, but maybe you want to understand a really close detailed analysis. And then you start looking at something like photogrammetry, like the stuff used uh, on the ROVs or deployed by a drone or by a diver. So the thing is that we need to really include photogrammetry as a remote sensing technique. And the reason is because it's really accurate. If you do it systematic, you get both qualitative and quantitative analysis. You create a digital record or archive. It's great for monitoring but it also allows further integration with other types of survey techniques so it will allow you to integrate other type of remote sensing techniques into that type of survey instead of just having a site plan which is drawn by hand it's also quick and cost effective um, it's complementary to these drawn uh, hand hand measurements uh, site plans but it's not just a pretty picture you have to understand what's the process behind it and this process is actually quite com complex and it's like in my personal development of how these these techniques have been evolving throughout the past um, almost 10 years now is a constant cycle of going through all these different stages of pre-process process and post-process so basically before you go out and set up and do a survey you think about your final product what do you want when you come out to do a survey and and it's also you got to think about times of doing things because Doing the data capture might take maybe an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, might be quite relatively quick, but the time to process all this data and the time to end, actually end up with an edit product, it can take weeks and weeks. So it is very important for you to think exactly what type of product you're coming, you, you want to end up with. 
So you can really plan the type of process you're going to go through. And this is constantly changing because you have different types of softwares, different type of hardware. Um, you perfection certain techniques and also you have limitations on certain sites that you might have to go around by let's say we're going to take videos instead of pictures you know there's different ways but you got to think about this whole process um, of workflow and this is and as i said this is constantly changing the other great challenge for those who don't work um, on the water is they have complete different um, variables on the water is not just as is going out and taking a camera on a nice sunny day up like today you have to deal with different type of light penetration scattering refraction distortion suspended particles bioturbation movement shadow stabilities and there's all sorts of ways of counteracting this um, by using different type of softwares you can do white balancing color correction different type of camera calibration because the distortion is going to be different depending on the setup you're using you have to really really time things with tides good water and have an excellent buoyancy control depending if you're doing it with a diver or an rov it doesn't really matter it's just these are the same variables behind the principles of, of using these things and i just re really like that little image on the top right what do you see in the evolution of uh simple uh camp action cameras like gopros and we've really really moved on and that just requires us to keep on the top of the technology because it does have an effect on the end product that we're going to be um, delivering. We constantly have to be improving and using the best that is available to us. And also you have expectations and the reality of working here in the UK, um, challenging, really challenging conditions sometimes. Let's see if I can get rid of the sound, sorry. Here on the left, you might think, yeah, you have amazing visibility it's great you can do the whole survey and when you get to the site well sometimes you can't really see much so is photogrammetry the only technique well in that case it isn't you have to wait and time things properly and you have to have that that background to actually deploy a traditional technique sometimes and then use it later on so it's not the solution to everything so I'm going to focus quickly on the stuff that we've done on Invisible because um, there's a great advantage of being able to work on a site for several years and you see how things have been changing and evolving throughout this time and how we've had to adapt our ways of, of serving. So even though they have the same principles, you have to constantly be learning and, and keep up to date with all, all the different changes. It's very different to being able uh, to actually go to a site where you only have a week's work you do a survey and then maybe you don't come back until another eight years pass or something. So this is why I picked this case study. And it's personally my favorite because it has a really, really extensive um, data set. And we have time to survey in high detail a lot of the structure. Um, so Invincible, just really quickly. She was a Royal uh, Navy ship that sank off Portsmouth, ran aground in 1758. And John, Commander John Bingaman started work along with a uh, fisherman who found it, John uh, Mack, Arthur Mack, sorry, uh, back in the 80s. So there's a lot of previous work on this, on this wreck site. There's almost 30, 30 plus years of, of work from different te te teams, different people working on it. ADU was on it, Wessex worked for a while. Um, Dan Pascoe became the licensee in 2012, took over from John Bingaman. And I joined the team in 2013, where we started experimenting with uh, photogrammetry in, in the early days, up, up, to, up, to, up to this year. And during 2017 up to 2019, we had three amazing excavation seasons with uh, Bournemouth University led by, by Dan, uh, Dave Parham. And we had a chance to survey extensively, really large areas of the Invincible, which I'm going to show. So behind all our archaeological surveys, we had in mind all these different things. So as I said, it's not just about the pre-picture of photogrammetry. So you had to think about the precision and accuracy of the equipment, the errors, the systematic errors that you might have during your survey, or how you're going to um, plot things in, in the future, measurement accuracy was uh, essential because everyone asks, how accurate is your model? 
well, you can prove how accurate it is because we've been using scales and we have ground control point networks. So that is that's also very important. The plotable accuracy and the repeatability, sorry, to be able to repeat the same survey uh, on site was also critical. So how could we guarantee that we were doing a repetitive survey on the site is we went on site and started putting all these control network before we started the excavation, we already had points that we knew we were going to survey constantly, go back on them and see a time series of how the site has been changing. So it's a very similar uh, principle to uh, using direct server me measurement, which is a traditional technique. So you create a, um, a network, but instead of using just targets, um, your control points, you're going to be using photogrammetry targets and they become your, your, your control points. So if you see on this image on the right, that just shows all the targets that we've been using that have been uh, attached to the wreck. And that way we can guarantee we're going to have that overlap between the different surveys throughout the years. The other really interesting thing is that we, because we had high resolution multi-beam, we could georeference all these surveys and put them on the seabed. This was quite new a few years ago. Now it's, it's commonly used. We saw that on the bronze bell break in the first presentation. Um, but yeah, georeferencing these these um, these data sets was, is, is critical because then you start putting everything into the same spatial reference. And on this image, I'm just showing a coverage that we had. This is one of the first data sets that we did back in two, 2015 with an extensive coverage. You can see there's our little um, survey uh, targets on the rec. And then this got expanded further. And that just shows on the multi-beam, this part of the, of, of the shipwreck that basically we covered a lot more extensively. And we also managed to cover other parts of the wrecks during that same season and how this whole coverage really extended because we have the excavation on site here. You can see there's a three by three grid. And obviously that allows you to see a lot more of the structure, not only what's on the surface, but really record what's, what is totally there. So here we're actually using photogrammetry as a remote sensing tool to monitor the changes on the site. And we can create this 4D image of what's what was happening on seabed. The other really interesting thing is is uh, trying to to display pre disturbance and post disturbance surveys. So that means before the excavation and after the excavation. And this is uh, focusing on that same area, which is part of the bio section. And as you can tell, this is quite a large area. It's been uh, emptied out, basically excavated throughout the whole season, very carefully, systematically using grids. But then we we managed to go and and, sur and survey the whole the whole area and compare it to what it looked like before we even touched it. But it's not just looking at the image; it's actually we're quantifying the amount of sediment we've moved. Um, we're looking at the changes on these timbers, and we can georeference the position of all the artifacts that we've been um, excavating on site. That's really interesting. And on, on the left, you can see there's um, also, we have a lot of multi-beam on the area and we can also monitor the changes to the site on a much broader scale. So it's combining all these different data sets that really give you a much better picture of the site. Um, so yeah, combining these type, different types of data sets, we managed to put back uh, the site plan from uh, John Bingaman from back in the 80s and 90s, overlap it on the on the structure using the photogrammetry as a um, as a reference. And this really allowed to to have a, a, even a, a further understanding of how the site has been changing, what parts have actually been eroded based on considering all the different types of uh, errors that you might have behind different techniques. It doesn't really matter. You're, you're analyzing the data spatially. And it, this is really, um, really interesting. And it just comes to show that even though we have different conditions to work on the water, we can still have that same level of precision or even more detailed precision sometimes at excavations that happen on land, um, just because of the way we're displaying these data sets and integrating them in the, um, 
during our excavations. This, this image um, shows the full extent of our photogrammetry survey. And if you look at the scale below 26 meters, it's quite, this is a very, very large area. And it's slightly deceptive in the sense that this is all overlaid on top of a multi-beam. And obviously we did the, this um, during different seasons. So it was actually all exposed at the same time. So that was back in 2017 and 18. This is in 2018 and 19, 2019 and 2019 as well. So it's all georeferenced, but the reality is that you don't have all these areas exposed the whole time during the, during the excavation. But behind this goes a lot of work and that's what I wanna uh, make the audience really understand so is not just the the image that it looks like, oh yeah it's great it's just the bow before getting to that stage it took a, a big team of divers to be excavating things systematically very carefully cleaning the site and then dan pasco had to really understand when was it ideal time to go and survey because look these are excellent conditions but you don't have that normally on sites in the uk so you really have to time it to have the best conditions on the water to get that survey and to time it nicely, you have to do all the weeks and weeks and weeks of work and actually clean the site just before the survey and even during the survey. So if you let me go back to this image, you can even see how we're using a um, an airlift while there's somebody trying to sur survey the wreck site and you try to clean, clean it, keep it as clean as possible because, I mean, the sea is such a dynamic place. To get that quality of data sets has a lot of work behind it. And to get high resolution data sets, well, you get high resolution cameras, you can focus on, on areas. And when you focus on certain areas, well, um, th that has a great advantage of having that level of detail. So here I'm, I'm showing an excavated, unexcavated area, which was part of the um, magazine. And once it was cleared out, we go down to high level detail where you can actually see things like carpenter marks. So this is really, really fine. Uh, engravings on the wood and we go down to that detail of um of surveying it which is great and here's our survey tags everything is geo-referenced everything is uh, controlled by this ground control network this is trench too i really like this trench shows a high level detail of certain parts of the area of the of the wreck um we can put this in different perspectives and that means because it's all in 3d we can display it in all sorts of different um fancy type of software Oh, sorry. Everything is basically using this, the right depths uh, with the multi-beam. We can put this on GIS, use different type of, um, of filters, like hill trays really bring out certain uh, parts of the, of the structure that helps me later on draw. And even though this, these drawings might look quite simple and it looks like these traditional methods going back, it actually just highlights certain parts of the, of the wreck that for it, interpreting it, it makes it a lot easier. So you're basically drawing a vectorized um, site plan on top of the photogrammetry. But because this was done in a single survey and it wasn't done by eight different divers, the site plan that is produced from based on the photogrammetry on the ortho photo is going to be of a much higher position. And the really interesting and challenging bit was, is going to be putting everything together from that large excavation and interpret and putting back these individual artifacts within these grids and how we're going to display this. So yes, comparing data sets with traditional methods, uh, drawing, going back to this photogrammetry. And oh, let me turn the sound off. Basically, this is this just shows the scale, not just little artifacts, but this is part of the car, cut water, this section of the wreck, which is a, an absolutely huge piece that was recovered from the site. And this is a photogrammetry survey done on in situ combined. And I'm trying to show here a video during the operation of the, uh, of the recovery. It really shows the scale of, the, of these type of artifacts and how we're also scanning these back in the warehouse using a handheld scanner that allows us to look at individual parts of the of this cut water that's actually been uh, disassembled and it shows really the scale of, 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 of these type of pieces. Here we have Felix, one of my colleagues, um, doing the survey. 
with a laser scanner. And going back to traditional methods of drawing up and site interpreting with these data sets. So how can we display all these type of data? There's some really, really uh, interesting uh, site tours which have been involved in some of them. This is the Invincible one, but there's loads that have been uh, sponsored by uh, Historic England, which I really encourage you to go and see. It's just different ways of bringing all these type of data sets and actually creating the storyline to understand these, these rec sites. And also another thing that I encourage you to go and see is the exhibition in the Royal Navy Museum that we put together with Invincible. Uh, there's this whole series of videos uh, during the whole process of the excavation that really shows shows the site and it's not just about the photogrammetry it's how you can combine that with uh, all sorts of different type of records and see if this works can you uh this is going to be too risky just going to skip that so it's basically just showing a this display which is in a touch screen and you have all the photogrammetry within site plans go and play with it it's absolutely amazing the other advantage of using something like Sketchfab is that people can go and consult it and see it online without having to move to an exhibition. And for example, here on the left, I'm just showing a project that I'm helping out uh, remotely by processing the data, putting everything on Sketchfab. And that allows large teams of, of research and, and public to go and see these, um, these individual things that because of coronavirus restrictions, they can't actually go and visit the site, but it also allows to have an international team analyzing all the different um, artifacts. And in this case, these are just um, mammoth bones that are coming from the uh, new built airport in Mexico City. And these are the type of things that we have to think about display and how we can interact with different types of communities, scientific or general public. I really like this this video that I encourage you to see. I uh, technology on Power, PowerPoint isn't the best. <laughs> I can't get it to play. So it's basically it's a 360 video done by the Black Sea Project with uh, by uh, Michael Grant and Felix uh, Pedrotti integrating really incredible photogrammetry that we did using our OVs. And you have this 360 video display to look at these. Um, these rec sites and at the same time you have a storyline where you have real footage of these rec sites and how it's others oh, starting to play and it's a full 360 i knew it was going to fail well go on go online search for it it's called black uh black sea shipwrecks and a virtual experience definitely worth having a go at it and this really show, allows us to do things like open days and, and um, maybe integrate 360 videos on the water stuff. Yeah, it's not going to work. Let me just skip this slide because it's crashing the whole thing. And what I see in the future is further data integration. Things like this is a, a survey that I did with Pat Tanner of the Mary Rose integrating terrestrial laser scattering and photogrammetry. And hopefully in the future, things like underwater laser scanners are going to be a lot more um, affordable and basically a lot more efficient as well. So we can combine it with photogrammetry and we have higher resolution data sets where we use active systems and passive systems and we bring the both of both techniques and actually get a really, really high end resolution data set. This is where I think you see things going. And Software is moving that way. MetaShape, for example, Agisoft is now integrating things with uh, laser scanners. So maybe in the future, we'll be able to do this uh, for underwater uh, sites and also integrating this in VR and AR analysis. So just quick conclusions. Um, there's nothing wrong with all traditional methods. We just have to what, think of innovative ways of uh, integrating them with digital records. Uh, also, photos and videos are incredibly valuable because photogrammetry is not the ends of, of of everything so you have to really create a story behind it and the more methods you have the better story you're going to be able to tell about this wreck computer generated Im imagery is going to be constantly changing along with marine geophysics and other remote sensing techniques and that means we have to keep up with innovation of, uh with software and, and hardware and because we're collecting data sets with the highest resolution as possible, we might be able to take these data sets and reprocess them in the future. And because they've been taken systematically, we will be able to reprocess them 
which is really important for us to keep a digital record uh, that we can reprocess later on. And lastly, I just want to have a few acknowledgements to all the people who have helped me out, uh, being able to test some, some things uh, throughout these different projects, especially, especially on Invincible with, uh, with them and Bournemouth Uni, and having the, the chance to work with 3D artists such as Grant and Felix uh, to get these surveys done and, and really deploy this integrated way of looking at shipwrecks, not just through a pretty image. So hopefully that came through nicely. Is there any questions, comments? I, th I, know, I think I went over time, but sorry. That, that, that was fantastic, Roger. We let you go over because um, well, it was just fill the gap. It's fascinating. Um, from our point of view, it's really nice to see the synergy between what, what you presented and, and what Graham presented and what we presented at the beginning, because whilst it's a, we're looking at very different areas and how it works, but everything links together, um, which is a really nice thing. So just, just one quick question before, you, before we move on to the next one. Um, so, so photogrammetry seems to be a very, very good way of recording uh, sites, and certainly to the level of detail when we have things like multi-beam bathymetry and nice site plans and everything else. But is this a... Is this a technique that the, the volunteer dive community can use to, to record their own sites? Or is this something that's kind of quite specific to the commercial world that, that we work in? I, well, I mean, anyone can do photogrammetry. It just takes time to actually get those skills up, like to a point where you can get a nice data set. It's just working, working, working. And I've been really lucky to give NAS courses to communities of divers that they're not archaeologists, they're volunteer divers. And because they're already good divers, it makes it easier for them to just focus on the task. And they've, they've come up with really, really good models in the future. Um, obviously, if you want to do something on a remote sensing level, you really have to understand how you're going to control these points, how you're going to scale these models, how you can integrate that into multi-beam. So that takes a different level, but anyone could do photogrammetry. And that is just basically drawing a, a picture just with digital techniques. Anyone can do it. However, we want to do it integrated and then take those data sets and reprocess them in the future. We got to do it to a certain standard where we can just push it forward. So um, it's just a matter of, of, of practicing. Of course, anyone can do it. Cool. Thank you, Rodrigo. Amazing. Thanks very much. We're going to move on to our final presentation of the session now by Heaven Mira, and it's titled Redeveloping the National Marine Heritage Record. So, Heaven, if you want to take over. All right, so good morning. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me here today. So I'm, I'm Heaven Mira. I'm a listing advisor in the National Listing and Marine Team at Historic England. Uh, so it's been brilliant listening to all the uh, sort of site-specific talks that have been going on here today. That's been fascinating to see all the really interesting uh, investigations going on. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is slightly different. Um, uh, it's going to come for a, a much more of a high level overview of what's going on with our national marine record um, and how we go about recording that uh, and to give you some of the work that we've been doing as part of our efforts to update the records as part of the heritage information access strategy so it's the HIAS program at Historic England. So uh, first of all why are we undertaking this work now? So this is part of Historic England's HIAS program. Uh, principle two for that states that Historic England should be the first port of call for uh, primary, uh, so the first port of call for and primary trusted source of national data sets, such as the National Heritage List for England and the National Marine Heritage Data Set. Uh, in addition to that, the, the data we had, it was all held on an aging data management system. And so there was a pressing risk that the system was going to fall over and that the information held within that would be lost forever. Uh, the platform on which the data was held was the, the AMI database. So that was a bespoke Oracle database, but was never really designed with marine information in mind. Um, therefore, it's always a bit of an awkward add-on and the data was not utilized to its full potential. In addition to that, with the changing to the regulatory system which we work in and the introduction of the MMO and marine plans and so on, and the unprecedented level of development and offshore work that's going on, there's a, a real need for an up-to-date and fit-for-purpose national marine record. <clears throat> so obviously, uh, I'm sure you're all aware that Historic England's got management responsibility for shipwreck sites designated under the Potential Wrecks Act. 
uh, and that section one of the act allows for the designation of restricted areas around wrecks of historic, artistic or archaeological importance. Um, there's 54 shipwrecks in England that are protected under section one of the act, uh, ranging from Bronze Age cargo scatters through to submarines and steam trawlers from the First World War and so on. Uh, the main source of information on these sites is, of course, the NHLE, uh, the National Heritage List for England, but um, they, of course, make up only a tiny fraction of that marine heritage resource. So yeah, it's just the tip of the iceberg, really. So the database we have, it's got information on over 37,000 shipwrecks that have occurred within territorial waters adjacent to England. Uh, this figure can then be further broken down into approximately 6,000 wreck sites whose position on the seabed is known. Uh, these records began as a snapshot of the UKHO RIC index back in 1992 and have then been further supplemented by other sources such as diver guides, uh, information supplied to us by divers, and sites discovered through the course of seabed development, as well as the results of our own funded research. Uh, the Historic England data set has then subsequently developed in parallel with the UKHO record as a distinct and complementary source of data. There's then a further 31,000 approximately uh, rec events, which are only known to us from documentary sources. Uh, so yeah, so they've come to us as a result of documentary research. Uh, the foundation of all that is Richard and Bridget Lance's excellent shipwreck index of the British Isles, uh, which is then expanded upon from other sources, including primary sources such as state papers and board of trade rec inquiries, U-boat log, uh, log, logs, uh, as well as newspaper research that was previously undertaken by visiting archives and searching through the original papers. Uh, but nowadays, of course, is so much easier thanks to the advent of online sources such as the British Newspaper Archive. Uh, research undertaken by local history societies is invaluable as a sort of information for us as well, as they often pick up wrecks of smaller vessels which will have escaped the national press and national reporting processes. Uh, these casualty records that we have, they form a, a, a vital part of record and reveal the maritime archaeology potential of an area. Uh, they provide avenues of research to suggest the identities of newly discovered wrecks on the seabed. And given that we don't know the positions of many of these losses, they're assigned to what we call name locations. So this as an arbitrary set of coordinates, and we'll return to these later on. So a bit of background on, on where this all started. So um, the marine record was started back in the early 1990s when the Royal Commission on the Historical Monuments of England uh, was tasked with creating and maintaining a record of archaeological material in coastal waters as part of the government white paper, uh, this common inheritance. At present, the data is largely restricted to territorial waters adjacent to England, i.e. it extends to a distance of 12 nautical miles. Uh, we do have some records that uh, extend further outwards, but they're the exception rather than the rule. Uh, the data itself is comprised of information which is currently stored on our warden database, and it's got a corresponding GIS spatial depiction. So I've, I've talked a bit about the shipwrecks already, but it's not just shipwrecks on the data and on the database. So what else is the record comprised of? Well, we've got um, this, this chart here gives you a breakdown of what we do hold. Uh, the shipwrecks obviously form the largest part of that with casualties, the, the documented losses forming the largest part. Uh, the remainder of that record is formed from unidentified features. So it's a mix of obstructions that were recorded on the seabed during geophysical survey um, or things like net snags reported as fishermen's fasteners. There's about 7,500 of these in the database, so they're a, an indication of the potential for archaeological remains to be present on the seabed. Uh, and there are many examples of sites which were originally reported to us as fishermen's fasteners and then have subsequently been investigated and revealed to be for wreck sites. Uh, the remainder of the record then is made of things like fine spots and isolated discoveries. Until recently, the data was publicly available via the Passcape website, um, but with the retirement of the AMI database, uh, Passcape was subsequently taken offline, and the data is currently available to external users via the Heritage Gateway under the Historic England Research Records heading. Uh, this allows for a spatial searches as well as textual searching, and if anyone's got any more bespoke data needs, then they're encouraged to contact us directly via our maritime uh, email address at maritime at historicengland.org.uk. 
So as part of our redevelopment, we undertook a series of stakeholder interviews and consultations in order to get uh, some information on the requirements that we had for the new system. So we spoke with commercial contractors and academics, government agencies, as well as the other home nations and coastal historic environment records. The key feedback that came back from the consultations included that the, the new system needed to be a one-stop shop for death-based assessment work. In addition, there was a, a strong desire that the interface should allow for the public enhancement of data. Uh, in addition, there was a strong request that we should be reviewing the spatial recording of, of the assets, uh, including the use of more appropriate coordinate reference systems uh, and the, reviewing the approach to recording wrecks whose remains have not yet been located. So these casualty records that I described earlier. The current data set covers the extent of territorial waters adjacent to England, but the, the new system should incorporate data which covers the full extent of the MMOs inshore and offshore marine plan areas from mean high water springs out to the seaward limits. So we also undertaken some concordance work with historic environment records that contain marine data. Uh, the key aim of this was to establish whether there was a large amount of data out there which we would need to incorporate into our new record at, a, at an early stage. Uh, some of these HERs have undertaken specific enhancement projects on the marine data, although much of the early enhancement projects had already been incorporated into the national record. In addition, it was clear that the majority of these HERs, which were recording marine data, were, were receiving their information via the same flow lines that we are. Uh, the key differences were, as expected, that the, the HERs had more information from local reporting, uh, specifically things like uh, from people reporting finds of timbers washed up on beaches, for example. Uh, and that there was, there's also a considerable difference in the methodologies used for recording those casualty records. Um, it's also been quite interesting to note that there were several instances of aircraft lost during the Second World War, which were missing from the national record. So there was a, a quick and easy enhancement win there. So where are we now? Well, we've undertaken a review of our internal flow lines to ensure that the information finds its way into the record in a timely manner. Uh, we're recording how things currently work against how we would like them to work in future. Uh, the information is finding its way into the record as a result of our HE funded investigations and as a result of development work such as aggregate dredging and offshore wind. Uh, fines are also reported to us directly by divers uh, and our information on recovered wreck is shared with us by the receiver of wreck, the MCA. Uh, we also undertake, undertook an exercise in audience mapping to ensure that we were capturing all the needs and goals and challenges that faced the various users of our marine data set. Uh, so that we could be sure that we knew it was using the data and uh, just exactly what did those users need and what changes we need to do to make the data meet those requirements. Uh, like I briefly touched earlier that we've been looking at how we need to amend these spatial depictions for things like the documented losses in future. Uh, at current, you can see the examples on the screen here, they're just, just large circles with a radius of 500 meters mapped to arbitrary sets of coordinates. Um, these were the system itself was developed back in pre-GIS days, so they don't make an awful lot of sense anymore. They're not terribly useful. So uh, on the left here, you can see Mounts Bay in Cornwall, uh, and then this area is further subdivided into over 20 named locations, with each referring to particular bays and rocks and headlands. So we need to find the best way to, to capture this information uh, while making the best use of the capabilities of a modern day GIS system. Uh, in the meantime as well, we've undertaken a comparison with other similar data sets, such as the UK HO data. Uh, what else could we record, but we don't currently, and what's out there already is data that could be incorporated, uh, as well as finding out what does nobody else do, but would be especially useful to us and to others. Uh, there's a huge amount of information that's currently only held in, in our records in an unstructured way. It, it's a, in, in their but it's lost in, in large text fields. Uh, for example, at present, it's not really possible to search through the data for uh, records of vessels built in a particular shipyard or uh, built in a particular location. Uh, the information is, in, is there in those records, but it's not structured. So uh, in addition to this, we're reviewing our thesauri as well to ensure that the, um, our terminologies are as comprehensive as possible. Previous, making sure that any previously overlooked vessel types are incorporated. 
for example, black hole frigates were identified recently as a uh, something that was missing from our from our index. So that's a type of three masted full rigged ship uh, built between the late 1830s and mid mid 1870s. Uh, so yeah, that was identified as something missing from the system, and as a so as a result of that, we've been able to undertake some enhancements and uh, make that information more retrievable in the future. So at Historic England, we're currently working on the migration of several internal systems onto the Arches platform, uh, and that's an open source system designed to allow cultural heritage organisations to inventory and manage sites of inter historic interest. Uh, the system was developed jointly by the Getty Conservation Institute and the World Monuments Fund, and Historic England has been assisting with the development of the platform through input on data standards. Uh, there's multiple instances of the system in use already, which many of you will have come across, such as the uh, Imena project database and the recently launched Isle of Man HER. Um, RL data was, has been migrated into a temporary instance of the Arches platform, uh, known internally as Warden, and we're currently building and refining the data models so that the marine data can be migrated into a finalised and bespoke system, uh, which is then specifically designed to hold marine data. One of the key benefits of using the Arches platform is that the data is provided with a semantic framework using the SIDOC conceptual reference model, uh, which is an international standard for controlled exchange of cultural heritage information. This defines the core information which should be part of any cultural heritage inventory. Uh, it means that the data is independent of the software platform, so that aids in sharing data externally between systems, and it also improves the longevity and subsequent data export and any migration. Uh, the data is then semantically rich and, and it moves away from just being a record of shipwrecks, but will also be a rich and complex record of the vessels and the people and organisations involved with their construction and their use lives, as well as detailed information on archaeological information then of the sites and landscapes associated with them. So we're, yeah, we're currently working on the migration of the Greater London HER to the Arches platform. Uh, and the development work being undertaken on this uh, will feed directly into the new version of our marine records, uh, which we're calling Man Mariner. Uh, so what we're doing right now, uh, while well, the data requires uh, a huge amount of cleaning to ensure it is consistent and standardised in the best possible shape for uploading, uh, the resource models are nearing completion. And as far as the timetable goes, we're looking at late 2021, early 22 for an internal version of the new Mariner system to be ready for full testing and then the live version going out later in 2022. So just to give you a really quick through, uh, a quick run through a search now, just to give you an idea of how quick and straightforward it can be. Um, we're obviously, we're looking for shipwreck sites here. So you've got, uh, you're looking for maritime craft uh, and that's gonna give us just over 6,000 wreck sites that we've currently got recorded on the database. Uh, if you wanna look for something specific, so we have a look for submarines, uh, and that gives us 125, which is great just to see how many is on there. Um, it's quite straightforward to do a map search as well. So here we've got a, uh, we can use a map search to draw search areas as points, lines and polygons and specify buffers around those. And uh, you could also import an externally produced search area as well. Uh, here I've used the map search filter to draw a polygon uh, just around Dover and Folkestone, and that's reduced our results down to 28. Of course, we're often interested in wrecks from a particular period as well. So we can use a time filter then to specify date of loss. Uh, so here I've used a time filter to specify First World War, which returns 10 First World, sub First World War submarine wrecks in our search area around Dover. Uh, at the bottom of the search area here, you can see the protected wreck of the German submarine U-8. And uh, we can pull up the full record to read online or export uh, reports and CSVs and shape files as required. So the timing for all this work has been very fortuitous. Uh, you may have seen the recent announcement of the launch of the Unpathed Waters project. Uh, Historic England is involved, closely involved in this project, which spans 23,000 years of maritime history, and it aims to make collections of charts and documents, images, film, oral histories, uh, sonar surveys, seismic data, archaeological investigations and art, artifacts more easily accessible to the public. So the, the project's going to involve uh, 15 universities, 63 heritage collections and institutions of different scales, uh, and as, as well as over 120 individual researchers and collaborators. This project forms part of the Towards a National Collection, 
uh, which is a five-year research program funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And it's exploring how the thousands of disparate collections can be explored by public audiences and academic researchers in the future. Uh, the project will be looking at how we can harness the potential of new technology to dissolve barriers between collections, opening up public access and facilitating research across a range of sources and stories held in different physical locations. Uh, the new Mariner platform will form a key part of Historic Inbound's involvement with the project. So there we go, that's a really quick tour through the content of the National Marine Records and an overview of the work we're currently undertaking to enhance these records, uh, make it fit for purpose for current needs. Uh, yeah, we're really excited to be part of the Unpathed Waters project and we look forward to sharing progress with you as the system development moves forwards. Uh, we'll be looking for people to test and provide feedback on things as they develop. So please do get in touch with me via the email address on screen there if you'd like to be involved with the development and testing work. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I'm happy to answer any questions you've got. Thank you. Um, got a couple of quick questions. We had questions coming in, but you seem to answer them as we're going along. So yeah. uh, well done on that one. But um, the, the first question is in relation to Oasis. And the, the question is, how will this redevelopment fit with Oasis and the ADS library? Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, Oasis is obviously a key, the, going to be the key component for recording those events that happen. You know, that's where we envisage and we'd like to see everyone who's undertaking marine work to be feeding their um, their reports into the ADS via Oasis. And then that, that will be a... Um, it's the signpost, you know, the, the national record will signpost then towards Oasis so that there's as much enhanced public access to, to the grey literature work as possible then. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, so the, the redeveloped National Marine Heritage Record, is this going to be a resource that's, uh, that, that's free and available to all? Abs well, absolutely. There's no intention for us to be um, restricting the access there. You know, we fully, fully envisage that being something that would be a, a, a resource that's uh, yeah, pu publicly available and, and there for everybody to use. Excellent. Um, uh, the final question from me, um, and I think Rodrigo's got his hand up to ask a question, but the, the final one we've got is, uh, so how often is the local AGR data going to be fed into the into the maritime record? Is this going to be something that's going to be annually or continuously? That's, that is to be determined. That's one of the things we need to answer. It's, it's, it's an interesting question to see. And then, uh, I think a lot of that is going to vary on how often they get these particular HDRs are updating themselves. So you might find some of them are quite static and they're not being updated that regularly, um, whereas others might be much more active and there's much more information. So I think it's a, it's there isn't going to be a one size fits all answer to that. It's about building those relationships and um, yeah, making sure everybody talks to each other to know when there's a lot of new information that needs to be incorporated. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Rodrigo, did you have a question there? Yeah, just really quickly. It's really nice to see a, a familiar platform. I've been working on something for two two years on, on the University yeah. of Southampton with the same system, uh, but basically we're recording sites in the Middle East and North Africa. And I think one of the main challenges is trying to come across, well, show the complexity of data of a single site where you have a lot of different data, for example, multi-beam and, and photogrammetry and all these types of surveys. And because of the limitations of the platform, sometimes you can't really display the complexity of research on a site, but you can, I think you can just put like different links and stuff. How, how, how challenging have you found that? I think, I think the key thing is that it's, we're not looking at, it's not meant to be everything hosted all in one space. You know, it's, it's very much a signpost to, you know, you're talking big picture, big areas these are the all the sites that are here and and things are linking and it's it's meant to be um, joining to things where stuff is hosted elsewhere rather than trying to hoover it all in and having it hosted within one platform because like you say that it's, it's it's too much information as well there's so much out there that it would be counterproductive to try and, and bring it all in so it's yeah very much about um showing people what's out there providing links sharing with other other platforms and institutions and so on yeah looking forward to that thank you cheers
Right, thank you, Rodrigo, and uh, thank you very much, Heaven. Uh, I'm just going to pass over to Phoebe now for uh, the, the rundown of the session. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, so if anybody has any other questions, um, please feel free to pop them in the chat. And if, while I'm wrapping up, if anything does come in, we'll try and uh, direct them to the appropriate people. But if not, oh, I know that, no, that's all it is. Sorry, Mark's fiddling with things. Um, Thanks very much, everybody, for coming to our session. And thank you so much to our presenters for a really excellent morning and a great start to the Innovation Festival. So we've had a really large variety of papers that really highlight the wealth of technological and methodological innovation that happens across the whole of the UK uh, marine archaeological sector. So this session has been recorded and it's going to be available to view again very shortly from the session listing within the festival portal. So thanks again and have a lovely afternoon and must, might I suggest you head over to the Innovation Underwater Improving the Accessibility of Marine Heritage session which starts at 2pm to finish off Marine Monday. But thanks, ever, thanks very much to our presenters and thanks again to everybody who's come to watch.